Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 14th meeting of 2018. Agenda item number one is management of offenders and um, agenda item two is our second evidence session on the management of offenders Scotland will I refer members to paper one which is a note by the clerk and paper two which is a, a private paper. Uh, we have two panels today and I welcome our first panel Karen McCluskey Chief Executive and James Blair Policy Lead with Community Justice Scotland and James Maybe Principal Officer Criminal Justice Services with Highland Council representing Social Work Scotland. Can I thank the panellists for your written evidence which is always so helpful to the committee in advance of our meeting. Um, now, I understand Community Justice Scotland. We would like to make a very brief, um, some very brief opening remarks. So, Karen, is it you or is it James? So, we, um, I was part of the um, electronic monitoring review over the last two years. We are very committed to reducing the amount of remand population, providing alternatives for um, people serving sentences out in community um, on electronic monitoring and we so I'm not quite sure what to um, sort of how deeply to go we'll have um, lots of questions but I understood you'd wanted to to say something in particular so it would just be a one minute two minute if there isn't anything in particular you want to flag up we've got lots of questions most of it was was contained in the evidence that we put in we are we are very supportive of electronic monitoring both GPS and transdermal alcohol monitoring and very supportive of the um, the review of, of disclosure of convictions um, and I'm happy to take any questions that's fine. And just to afford the same uh, courtesy to uh, Social Work Scotland and Mr Maybe, was there anything you wanted to say before we, we go move to our formal questioning? Thank you. Just really to echo what Karen McCluskey has said, Social Work Scotland is very committed to the electronic monitoring agenda um, and also in respect of disclosure issues and the pro board matters that have been brought before the committee. So just to echo that, thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll go move straight to questions, starting with John Finney. Good morning, panel, and I thank you for your, your um, evidence. It's, it's been very helpful. Ms McCluskey, you, you talked about the 2016 report on the Electronic Monitoring Working Group, and it argued that the use of electronic monitoring as a standalone measure remains legitimate, but that it should be available in conjunction with other interventions. Do you agree with that, and, and in what circumstances would you see one or other being appropriate, please? Well, there is obviously some use... I mean. Whilst the, the bill doesn't really go far enough, in my opinion, I think the opportunity to use electronic monitoring for bail and remand is a missed opportunity in the bill, and I would have liked to have seen it extended. There are opportunities for using electronic monitoring on its own, where it doesn't need support, but for, the, for a great number of the people that we are supporting out in the community, they will need the support. It's a bit like wearing a Fitbit on your wrist. You need support to try and go out and do some other exercise. And for many of the people that we are trying to support, they need to be supported to remain compliant. Um, they need to be, you know, brief motivational interviews. They need a, a, a huge package of, of support around them. It's not just technology. The technology works as 100% accurate. Both transdermal alcohol monitoring and indeed GPS is incredibly effective. On its own, it's only technology. It requires the skills of criminal justice social work and indeed the third sector, who I think are sometimes neglected in, in this area, to support people to remain compliant and get them to the end of the sentence. Thank you. Would, you. would you care to comment on that, Mr Maybe? Thank you. I would echo that. I think the research evidence that the um, Electronic Monitoring Working Group considered during the course um, that it sat um, clearly shows that where support is available alongside electronic monitoring, that is when it is most successful. Um, and I think that, that's a really key point to make um, to the committee, that support is crucial, whether that's through criminal justice social work uh, or through the third sector. That has to be an integral part of electronic monitoring in the future if we are to maximise it, its potential success. Indeed, that, that's the word that jumps out from both your submissions there about the, the, the value that's placed in that. Now, the Scottish Government says it's committed to making electronic monitoring more person-centred. 
and more fully integrated with other community justice inter interventions. So, uh, you mentioned bail and remand, Ms McCluskey. I mean, do you believe that uh, uh, these proposals go far enough? I would like to see them going further. I think I gave evidence um, a couple of weeks back in terms of remand. A remand population is too high. There is definitely a percentage of those who are on remand just now who may be suitable for electronic monitoring, which would both enable them to become be compliant and indeed protect victims, which is an incredibly important part of this as well, and would enable people to stay in their accommodation, you know, keep them you know, within their family, family network, and, and stop some of the harm that we're seeing through the inappropriate use of remand. Yes, Mr. Mayor. So, Scotland um, would certainly support the uh, electronic monitoring being available for remand. I think and we know the remand population in Scotland is very high. We know that bail supervision, as it currently stands, is, is incredibly underutilised across Scotland. I believe there are pockets where courts are using it, but certainly, and I can speak from my own experience in Highland, bail supervision currently is woefully underused, um, despite continually promoting it um, within courts, with sheriffs, with defence agents, um, and with the Crown Office. And I think there is certainly the possibility that if electronic monitoring was available as part of remand, as a bail condition, that we might see an increase in the use of bail. Um, again, I think it's important to recognise that probably in the majority of cases it needs to sit alongside support, but if you've got a bail supervision service being provided through criminal justice social work in the third sector um, with a tagging element, I think it's reasonable to assume that courts might have more confidence in using it um, and indeed that confidence would then spread out in a, in a sort of ripple effect um, throughout the, the public uh, and with victims again, which obviously are, is a con crucial consideration to take into account. If that, finally, just one point in your submission, you say, and I quote here, in most cases, in order to support desistance from offending, additional supervision and support would be required, which must be adequately resourced. For the avoidance of doubt, are we talking personnel, money, both? Probably both. Um, certainly in terms of the financial memorandum, there's been an attempt to try to quantify um, the cost element of the, the impact of the, the um, proposed um, legislation. But I think until we get to the actual actuality of it, it's very difficult to know. Um, certainly in terms of community payback orders, for example, as the committee will know, currently at the point of conviction of sentence, a, a restriction of liberty order can be made alongside a community payback order. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good thing that the proposal is that electronic monitoring can become part of, of a community payback order at, at the point of sentence um, as a requirement, because I think that, that brings together, conflates the, the tagging element along with the support element. Um, and I think it's a reasonable assumption to make that the number of standalone RLOs might drop as a consequence of that. But I think... There's a lot of dubiety around the actual cost of a community payback order. Um, two years ago, a lot of work went into trying to establish the unit costs of a community payback order, and the, the outcome of that was, was incredibly inconclusive. Um, and I think we do have to be mindful of the impact. I think it's right to try and quantify and put forward uh, proposals around cost, but I think we do need to track the actuality of it when the legislation is enacted and we're actually dealing with that. Uh, in actuality to see what the impact is because it would be a failed opportunity if we ended up with increased workloads, increased pressures on social workers um, and the legislation and the intent of that kind of falls through the cracks because there is insufficient resourcing to deal with it. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And you? As a supplementary to, to the, the answers uh, both of you have given so far, I mean, I think if the purpose of this is to avoid people uh, being in, in prison. I think your, your points around uh, bail and remand are, are well made. I mean, what considerations might there be if you were to include that? Do, can you sort of see reasons why perhaps it hasn't been included or how straightforward would it be to expand the scope of the legislation that we're, we're, we're looking at to include, include uh, remand? I'm not really sure. I think you would probably have to ask the policy colleagues about mm -hmm. why it wasn't included. There probably would be a cost element to it. There's, there's little doubt. We have um, a lot of people on remand. It costs a bit of money. It costs less than incarceration. 
Um, we would need some justice reinvestment to be able to support some of the third sector, etc. So I, I'm, I'm unsure about why it's not been included at this stage. Okay, but in terms of practical provisions, I mean, from your perspective, is there anything that, that you'd, you'd want to see in the bill if it was to expand to the, these categories? Well, that's really, I mean, no. it is really just that, that area. And just to comment further on that, I think um, in, in respect of bail and electronic monitoring, I think it would certainly be a, a really good thing to do. I think it wouldn't take, and as I understand it, the way the bill has been drafted is to enable future things yes. to be incorporated without having to go through too much jumping through hoops and hurdles to do that. And it would seem to be a missed opportunity. I mean, there was some bail pilots, um, electronic monitoring in the mid-2000s, um, and I think it's fair to say the, the evidence of those were a little mixed in terms of uptake. Um, but given the, the, the focus around reducing the Roman population, um, I think it really would be a missed opportunity not to consider it as part of the, of the bill and the final act. So similarly, um, and I'm following on from John Finney's questions, I think there's comments both in, in the submissions um, that Community Justice Scotland have made, but also uh, the Howard League and others, about a concern about uh, ensuring that this is used to get people out of prison rather than increasing the tariff of people that, that, that would be at liberty, uh, albeit with restrictions anyway. I was just wondering if you might be able to sort of expand on those thoughts and concerns and, and what sorts of safeguards you'd like to see to try and prevent that from being uh, how this is used? There is always a concern with electronic monitoring that it becomes a panopticon in the community. Yeah. Everybody's under surveillance. And GPS indeed does gather a huge amount of data and that will be something that we will really need to consider as we go forward. However, I think that there are, there are enough safeguards in place. I mean, my colleagues in criminal justice social work use LSCMI in frame to you know, assess the risk around um, people you know, going on electronic monitoring as opposed to incarceration. I, th I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a useful way forward for us. Mm -hmm. I think from the Social Work Scotland perspective, uh, I think we're very clear that Electronic monitoring is not a panacea. It's not for everybody. We have to take cognizance of the net widening potential effects of electronic monitoring as and when it becomes available in, in, in more, more forms. But I think the, the key is around the risk and needs assessment that goes along with uh, electronic right. monitoring, um, whether that's as part of bail, whether that's as part of a community payback order or part of a prison license uh, or indeed a SOPO or a ROSHO. Uh, that is absolutely critical that there is a professional risk and needs assessment um, as to the suitability of that particular individual for uh, electronic monitoring as part of their, their, their sentence. So, so just on that very point, I, I know that Criminal Justice uh, Scotland's submission in answer to question three in your written submission, you go into some detail about your concerns about risk assessments and the need for greater clarification um, in the bill. I was just wondering maybe if you could expand on those points. Uh, given them that Mr. Maybe raised that. A apologies if I'm <laughs> making you check your own work. I, I think what it comes down to is the, the court being afforded with all the relevant information to base an appropriate decision on. And our concern is, is there enough resource being attached to that so criminal justice social work is able to afford the court with all the information so that the right outcome for the individual and, and the, uh, obviously the court is taken forward. And so it's simply around resourcing in time. And I think our, our colleagues have um, stated that as well. It's around the Section 27 funding um, to make sure that the local authorities are resourced accordingly so that an individual has an appropriate outcome for them. So, so it's about the money that, that sits behind this rather than what's drafted in the bill, is that correct? Um, the, 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 there are sections of the bill which are confusing. Um, so there is must in some places, should, and the policy memorandum um, makes reference to different rules, but it, it's not quite clear, these sections. So we, we have um, made... Uh, applications to the Scottish Government just to clarify those sections, just to make it clearer, because our concern is that um, the funding might not be there, so criminal justice social work can't um, make uh, the, uh, 
the full and frank assessments that they need to make for the court. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Morris. Good morning, panel. Um, we've talked about the bill and we've talked about um, the, the, the new forms of monitoring, such as GPS monitoring of, of a person's movements, but also now looking towards alcohol and drug, drug use. Okay? Um, what opportunities uh, and risks do the, these represent to you? Maybe, Ms. Glass, you might like to okay. respond so, to that. Um, so I've got quite a big interest in transdermal alcohol monitoring. I, I brought some bracelets over about six years ago and... I've been discussing it ever since, wrote some papers on it. I think in my previous role in violence reduction, 80% of what we dealt with was alcohol related. Mm -hmm. Alcohol, we are saturated. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is addicted. This is not suitable for those who are addicted, but those who are going out on a Thursday, Friday night and when they get drunk, they are, uh, their behavior is, is toxic. Mm -hmm. And we know that helping them desist from drinking is, is a, is a suitable support. So the transdermal alcohol bracelet tests the ethanol in your sweat every 30 minutes and electronically transmits it. And when we put it on before, we used to say to people, you need to find your sober friends in your sober places. And I would help you not drink. It needs to be about support. Alcohol is everywhere in our society. Trying to get people to desist from not drinking is, is quite difficult. It's a challenge, but we know that when people do have alcohol monitoring on, they use the bracelet to save face. You know the um, have a drink, have a drink, have a drink. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me to have a drink, I'm wearing this. It's probably one of the biggest psychological effects of wearing the alcohol bracelet is that you, it's, it's a, there's a, a real, your ability to try and take yourself away from the crowd and, and change. There's been over a million uses of it um, in the States in terms of the tests. Over 17,000 people in Dakota um, on the 24-7 sobriety um, experiment that they did there. Oh, we have not used it in the UK widely, although in London when they used it, they had a 94% compliance. Mm. So they did a, a, a study in London. I think it is, uh, you know, and when I've spoken to colleagues of mine um, who've been your sheriffs, every court is an alcohol court in Scotland. Every court is an alcohol court. You know, we have lots to do with drugs. We need other tools to be able to address people's drinking. Can I ask supplementary on this, Kavita? Do you really feel this will be effective, obviously, from the, the success in London and the States? Well, they have, they have a lot of it. I mean, we've not used it widely. Well, we've not used it at all up here just now. Have you trialled it, though? Sorry? Have we trialled it yet? Well, I've, I've, I've trialled it. We've written a few papers on it. Um, they were physically it. trialling it. Then. Well, no, we, had to, we actually had to have it in legislation before oh, we okay, could trial okay. it. So it is a Hobson's choice. You cannot force anybody to wear alcohol monitoring. They have to consent to it. And there is a bit that is a teachable moment to try and address people's behaviour. I've always seen alcohol monitoring in particular something that helps us address some quite aberrant toxic behaviour. Um, and you know, and contributes to a great deal of our crime. Mm -hmm. Could I ask Mr Maybe to respond as well? Thank you. If the convener would allow, could I just add a comment to the previous speak, uh, speaker's question? Um, it's not just about the money. Money's great, and we'd always want more to do more with that. But in terms of the, the information and the evidence that criminal justice social work receive, in respect of informing our risk and needs assessment, the level of service and case, and case management inventory tool, mm. one of the things that's sorely lacking on the whole is the summaries of evidence um, that get, get narrated in court. Um, often, uh, more often than not, the social worker is entirely reliant on the information that the offender is providing as part of the criminal justice social work report. Um, this has been a, a bone of contention for a long time and has been raised on numerous occasions in every conceivable um, forum because it is a critical part of, of uh, enabling the social worker to provide a much more um, evidence-based and objective report around risk and need. And without that, we are, as I say, entirely reliant on the offender's version of events. Um, and there may be really important information that's, that's missing from that, um, particularly in relation to victims. Um, in, in respect to sex offenders, we do get provided with information, and that, that is incredibly helpful and informative. Um, and I would make a plea that that is something that, that does need to be considered. Uh, I appreciate that there are um, practical issues in relation to how these summaries are often narrated in court, they're not written down, so that 
creates a problem, but I'm sure there is a way to get over that particular hurdle. It would significantly improve the, the strength and quality of risk and needs assessments if we were to have that information routinely um, on every occasion. To come on to the issues around um, alcohol, um, three things I'd, I'd want to say. Um, Social Work Scotland make reference to this in our submission around how people change their behaviour. It's not a linear process. Um, there's a cycle of change there um, and people go through that cycle sometimes several times and relapse is, is not always the case but in more, often, more often than not that, that is part of that cycle. Um, I'm sure we can all think of dieting or trying to stop smoking, um, how often you, you actually go back to that behaviour um, and you go around that cycle. And I think that there is a, a potential risk with alcohol monitoring that it's seen too much in, in terms of black and white. Um, and I think we, if we're going to have legislation around um, this, and I, I would support that, I think we have to make sure that's the right guidance and it's used in the right way that recognises that um, if you put somebody uh, onto a requirement regarding not using alcohol, that there is a, a quite a high likelihood that they will mm -hmm. breach that at some point. Mm -hmm. And that has to be part of, of that sentence and ongoing management mm -hmm. um, of that particular individual. Um, I think that's an absolute critical point to make. Often, as parole license conditions, we might get a condition that says somebody must not drink. Um, that creates a problem where there's a dependency, because mm. that individual really, that, that's asking something that's just not possible. Um, so we have to be mindful of that, I think, in, in how we kind of create the, the legislation and the landscape around remote alcohol monitoring. Um, and, and the other point to make, um, is that we must also not forget the post-sentence um, issue here. Um, and this applies to all electronic monitoring, indeed potentially all sentencing um, options, is that once somebody gets to the end of their period of statutory supervision, often the, the research would back this up, that um, how do you sustain that, mm. that level? If somebody's made good progress through their CPO or their prison licence, um, how do you sustain that beyond that period of statutory supervision. And I think we have to give, give considerable thought to that. Um, that might involve the third sector and it might involve resources. But again, if we're looking at this as a very sort of medium long term issue, we need to build that in. People are only going to be on CPOs for a maximum of three years. Mm -hmm. uh, most people on licenses will not be on those licenses for you know, forever. Um, what happens after that? Um, social work will obviously try and link people into community-based resources, but those resources need to be there um, to make that work and make that happen. Can I just ask something, if I may? Have you talked to Drink Aware campaign? Drink Aware campaign, the, the, the um, alcohol body, the, the, the drinks industry? Well, I work quite a lot with Alcohol Focus Scotland, and yeah. obviously I'm quite engaged in sort of lots of the alcohol groups, but not Drink Aware. But this is a way of getting the message out about responsible drinking. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if it's been no, discussed. I, I, sorry, I, I mean, I just, just to follow up on, on the alcohol. Yeah. When we initially looked at this six years ago, there were lots of sheriffs who were sentencing and saying in their sentence, you're not allowed to drink. And obviously, we, the only thing we had was breathalyzer at the moment. You can drink around breathalyzer. You lose about a unit of alcohol per hour. And so those who were using breathalysers, they could drink around it. We used a course of conduct, so two or more offences where alcohol has been a factor in your offending, not a unique correlating cause, mm -hmm. but a factor. And we used that as the criteria for using the alcohol monitoring. So you weren't just the first time you get caught with a drink-related crime. You didn't go on this. But there is, um, there is a, a gathering body of evidence about supporting people. And Mr Maybe is absolutely right. You need to be very thoughtful around this. We certainly, even when we were doing some of the studies, we did not, you know, when someone started to drink or they had one drink, we'd phone up and say, are you finding this difficult? We'd do brief motivational interviews around alcohol because at the end of the day, we wanted to keep people compliant but recognised how difficult it is. And obviously there is a, a you know, a, a, a motivational thing around this and failure absolutely is part of it. And Prashek and De Clementi, which is a motivation to change model, would say that we expect people to fail, mm -hmm. but that is also a teachable time. Mm -hmm. That's a teachable time when you can actually intervene again. 
It's, um, I think it's about being smarter with our justice. It is going on an evidence base so that an individual is supported with the addictions that they have. Um, if we look at alternative forms of sentencing, a custodial sentence, those issues will still be there when the individual is released. Um, so this is about the society supporting an individual through a process to have better outcomes and to be smarter in the way that we look at that as well. And, you know, we, we are convinced that there is an evidence base to take this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Okay. Uh, Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'm interested to know how electronic monitoring affects the families of people being monitored, and um, does more need to be done to mitigate any difficulties with that? I certainly think that home detention curfew is, is a big ask for lots of families. Having someone in a house from seven to seven, I think might be really quite difficult for families. We know that families can support people to, be, you know, to comply with their order, but it also takes a great toll on them. I do think the extension of this to GPS allows us to be more flexible, um, a lot smarter about how we um, induce compliance from people around staying away from certain areas, certain places that could be victims or witnesses' houses. So that probably is slightly less onerous than some of the HDC and RLOs. And how, how often, just for a point, how often is that, is that used? GPS. GPS is yeah. not just now. So this well, is obviously not, part so of the legislation. Part so, of the and it is incredibly interesting. If you look at some of the work that's been done in Germany, they have some quite complex, you know, exclusion zones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it obviously buzzes if you get too close to it, so it tells you to move away. And so you can use it very cleverly mm -hmm. to, to try, and it's individualised. So mm -hmm. it's not just a blanket ban. You can mm -hmm. individualise it to each person. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think it's certainly an issue in respect of the impact on, on families, um, I think for, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. um, where there might be an underlying tension between the partners in the household. Clearly, if somebody is confined, that can be exacerbated and there may be unintended consequences as a part of that. Um, I think the research is, is fairly limited in respect to this, and I think this is something that, that would, need, you know, would benefit from, from a further study. Mm -hmm. um, the GPS is interesting because I think there's a, a default conclusion drawn that that's, that's more intrusive, um, but I think there is some evidence that would suggest that it can be less intrusive because somebody is not confined to a particular place, so they can go around their lawful business, providing that they're obviously not um, going into the exclusion zone that, that's been set up, um, the fact that they're not actually confined to one place. Yeah. Um, and again, it comes back to the assessment and having a really thorough strong assessment that takes into account the situation within the household mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that the in individuals within that household are spoken to and that, that fuller assessment um, is carried out. Mm -hmm. well, what feedback do you have from families? Do you find they're generally supportive of EM? I would have to say that that's difficult to comment on um, because I, I'm not sure I've got an evidence base to, to do that from. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect it's, it's mixed and that it, it will work successfully in some places, but in other circumstances, as I say, there may be some, some difficulties that arise from that. Mm. Um, and that has to come back again to the ongoing super, supervisory element in terms of the ongoing contact, not just with the offender, um, but with the family, to make sure that if there are issues, that they're picked up on immediately um, and considered an action taken if necessary to, mm. to head off any, any potential mm. difficulties. And do the children in the household get any kind of, um, I say, counselling or explanation about what, what's going on if, if one of the adults in the house is, you know, under a curfew? Do the children understand that generally? What's? I think it's important that, that every member of the household is mm. is is aware of what's happening, mm -hmm. um, because children are very observant mm -hmm. and they will see that a box has been put in that that the father or mother is wearing a wearing an you know an ankle bracelet um, and that will provoke the obvious question mm -hmm. so i think there has to be there has to be an integral part of, mm -hmm. of planning for electronic monitoring mm -hmm. so that there aren't any surprises and shocks um, mm -hmm. and obviously de depending on the the age and stage of the of the, of the individual children mm -hmm. that they are they have sufficient uh, answers and, and information mm -hmm. who would that come from Do, would you say it would be done by the electronic monitoring provider, G4S, currently. They're, they're the, obviously the, the people who go into the household and, and, and fit the box. 
um, but also where there's a supervisory element, then I would expect the criminal justice social worker to be part of that, that um, discussion as well. Mr Blair, you wanted to? Yeah, it's just to reiterate, we, we are supportive of families outside and their submission. I'm, I'm sure they'll have more to say later on today. Um, on, in terms of the GPS technology, we have come on a long way, but um, we do live in Scotland, and the geography and topography means that it's not always accurate. Um, so the technology, and I'm just reiterating from our point of view, the technology is moving on, but there are parts of Scotland where there is no GPS coverage. Um, and also that does come down to inner cities as well. So at the point of assessment of what is available, we need to look at is GPS appropriate and for now or in the future. Yeah. Um, so there are some concerns about that. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, Jenny, supplementary. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I have a brief supplementary to Rona Mackay's point on GPS. Um, there are obviously limitations to that, that system, uh, and as Scottish Women's Aid have pointed out to us, it, it doesn't detect contact via phone, social media, text, or chance encounters. So it won't catch certain types of behaviours, and they also point to research from America which said that using GPS monitoring pre-trial made victims feel anxious because they could see their abuser moving about freely. Um, are there limitations then for the use of GPS monitoring with regard to certain types of crimes, so for example, domestic abuse? I mean, I think that will come down to a social work assessment. Yeah. I mean, and James would probably be better to um, comment yeah. on this. The anxiety of victims should never be, you know, should never be ignored. Mm -hmm. Because I think any victim seeing someone out in the street, you know, if, if it's, you know, whether it's a violence, whether it's a, a man, whether it's a woman, it can be incredibly difficult. And I think it's up to the risk assessment to try and pick out who is, you know, when it's proportionate to be, to be used, both in terms of victims and indeed whether it's suitable for the person that you're actually putting it on. So, mm -hmm. so there are considerations, as there are in, in, in you know, RLOs and HTC right now. I think the, the, the voice of the victim and the issues surrounding protecting vulnerable people and victims is, is, is key, it's paramount, it has to be part of any thorough risk assessment. Um, I don't think any order license is a, is a magic bullet, nothing is ever going to work perfectly. There will always be instances where things don't work for a whole multitude of reasons. Um, but it does come back to the to the risk assessment and to pick up the earlier point about having as much information in which to be able to formulate that assessment. Um, the issue around the, the geography and the limits of the technology is well made um, by my colleague from Community Justice Scotland, um, and that currently is, is a fact of life. Um, but I don't see that that should be a, a reason not to, to move forward. Um, it's not unique that certain... Um, programs, for example, are not available throughout Scotland. For example, a Caledonian system is, is not currently available to all criminal justice social work services. Um, but it's a start, and money has been made available, made available to further roll that out. Um, I think a further point I'd like to make is, obviously, the, the current contract for the delivery of electronic monitoring is up for renewal. I think in 2020 the contract expires. Um, I think another really key point to make is that the, the links between the provider of the electronic monitoring service, whoever that is, uh, currently G4S, um, and criminal justice social work has to be absolutely excellent um, because there has to be that, that synergy, there has to be that, that working together um, to achieve a, you know, a shared goal and a shared aim um, with a real understanding of what the different partners bring to the table. Um, in terms of the support, the, the technology, and, and the, the crossover there, so that criminal justice sh social work understand the limitations of the technology, what, what is going to work, what isn't going to work in terms of the, the landscape, the island authorities or remote rural communities, such as in Highland, for example, um, where this is going to be problematic. There has to be that, that really good um, consistency and joining together um, Currently, I, I think, from my own experience, G4S provide an excellent service, and I think I would can confidently say that that's a reflection of Social Work Scotland's view. Um, I hope beyond the life of this contract, whatever comes next, that's continued. Um, we have to get that right in the future. Um, if we don't, again, we risk undermining 
what we're, what we're trying to achieve with electronic monitoring. Lou? Um, I, I would just like to reiterate um, sections from our response where um, we would like to see that the guidance is co-produced um, because of the, the rights who have, of those who have offended, but also the rights of victims are respected. And this is a very, very polemic, contentious issue. It, it, it's, it's one of those that I think we need to get around the table so we get the right balance and that everybody feels that they have a part going forward. And I think that can only be done in a co-productive environment. So we have our Scottish Government to do that. OK, a very brief supplementary, Liam MacArthur. It was just on the point Mr. Neville was making about um, uh, GPS coverage and actually some of the communities that um, uh, where this may be impractical. Um, those also happen to be the communities where incarceration is likely, therefore, to take place much further away um, from uh, the, the family and, and, and home network. So, uh, would it be your expectation that the, the future contract actually, um, as a priority, um, looks to address any gaps um, in the in the coverage so that we can see something um, that is applicable where appropriate uh, across the country rather than in a, in a rather piecemeal fashion and would you also expect the um, the mapping exercise that is done to be a good deal more reliable than the mapping exercise either for mobile phone coverage or broadband coverage uh, which the operators will, will will give you some degree of comfort but the actual lived experience on the ground is a far cry from from that mapping exercise so how would that work i think the answer to that is, is yes i think that has to be an integral part of, of the future um, and i think we have to create a culture of honesty um, in terms of what works, what doesn't work, where the gaps are, um, and the plans to, to try and um, plug those gaps. I know myself from driving down this morning, you go through pockets where you would almost least expect it, where suddenly the, the DAB cuts out on the radio, for example, and you go into, into a black hole, and you're not necessarily in, in a tunnel, for example. So I think that has to be part of the, the future consideration, and we have to have some very clear, honest statements about that so that uh, we're making decisions you know, based on, on, on that clear evidence. I would just say RF will still be available. So we will still be able to use RF. And so whilst GPS, we're going to have to wait probably, and I, and I would expect in five years' time that this will look entirely different, because we certainly don't want to disadvantage people from rural communities. We would like to keep them in their communities, in their houses, or with their families, you know, in a supportive environment where criminal justice, social work, and third sector can support them. So we shouldn't have a two-tier system. Um, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'd like to come at this from a slightly different angle. Some people, uh, some communities, might look on any increase in electronic monitoring with some degree of concern. Someone behind bars is not able to recommit a crime within the community. Uh, and uh, Karen McCluskey said there, we want to keep people in their community. Uh, the community may not want the people in the community. Uh, so it begs the question, do the proposals offer any additional or indeed sufficient protection for the victims we looked at uh, and also the community more generally? There is an evidence base of compliance with GPS and indeed transdermal alcohol monitoring, but you're right. I think we need to educate the community around what G, you know, GPS and, and electronic monitoring can do in the wider, in the, you know, in sort of in its wider sense, alongside support. We already have people who are in, you know, obviously in community sentences just now, and we have more to do. You're absolutely right that that needs to improve. I would hope the use of EM could. Um, could induce compliance. And we know that the evidence base is if you put someone on electronic monitoring and provide them with the right support, they are increasingly compliant. And indeed, in some of the voluntary programmes that have been done, people actually wanted to keep it on when it finished. So they found it helped them desist from crime. But we have a, you know, we have, you know, we have a difficult situation just now with the level of remand, with people on short-term sentences sometimes just for very you know, short terms. We know that 98% of women get a sentence of less than 12 months. Surely it's better for us to look at different ways to keep people compliant in the community and support them to remain, you know, to not re-offend. I don't necessarily dispute that, uh -huh. um, particularly in relation to remand, which we looked at <coughs> in, in some depth. Uh, my, my concern is that the community 
may not... When, when you were answering me there, Karen McCluskey, you were talking about educating the community, inducing compliance, helping them desist from crime. The community may well be saying, look, we've been, I don't know, terrorised by a particular individual. We don't want that person back. We want the criminal justice system to... Uh, keep them away from us, not put them back in our community. How, how do you respond to that? Well, this isn't binary. Not everybody in a sentence of under 12 months is automatically going to go into the community. Well, there will be those who it has decided that for the protection of the public will have to be on remand or indeed any short-term sentence. But there is a percentage of people who are in our custodial environment just now who would be much better suited to a community sentence and would be much better um, supported by use of electronic monitoring, and in particular our women, because they are not going to be served well by two months in our prisons, where we then come out to homelessness and a whole range of other challenges. There must be a better way to do this. And we will absolutely have to support them differently. And do you think there are sufficient protections within the proposals to, to, to come at it from the community's point of view? I think we need a complete paradigm shift. I absolutely think that we need much more support in the community. We need to you know, invest more in our third sector because third sector, I think, can support people in a, in a very different way from either myself or indeed um, criminal justice social work. So it will need some justice reinvestment. There is little, little doubt about that. Um, I, I think the word here is supportive. So the technology can be used in a smarter way to be supportive for communities. So if it's an exclusion zone, that would support the communities involved. And I think that would give confidence as well to victims that there is an exclusion zone so that if the, the person with the conviction went into the area, then the remedial, um, uh, the police or whoever would come and uh, take that forward at that point. It needs to be visible. Yes. Non-compliance needs to be robustly dealt with. Absolutely, because otherwise it's just ever increasing. And that is one of, I mean, that's obviously one of the recommendations when we looked at the electronic monitoring report that we needed to look at how we robustly addressed compliance. About 30% of the sheriffs at the moment will put a very robust programme around the, the you know, last criminal justice social work for every small breach. Others, it's less so. And I think as we go forward to give the public confidence that we're dealing with people appropriately, um, and to protect them, that we set up a very robust um, programme to manage people in the community. In compliance, Mary, I believe you've got questions on, on that. I, yeah, it was really just uh, a few questions that were based around the submission that you put in. And I noticed uh, there was a quite similar thread between what you'd submitted and a few other submissions that we'd had to the committee too. Uh, one of that was around the language that you talk about in the bill and the use of the term offender and, it was, um, and how that's used in so really just to hear a bit more about that from yourselves and how you think, if you think that should be changed within the bill. Um, well, we, we actually said in our response that we thought the language, the terminology and perhaps the title of the bill should change. Uh, this parliament had quite a discussion in, in the run-up to the 2016 Community Justice Scotland Act. Um, and it was around how we talk about convictions, how we talk about those who have offended, those who have convictions. And it's important um, because it, there is an anxiety around convictions, so it's about getting the right language so that an individual, when they have been reintegrated uh, back into society, they feel part of society, so that's important. But there are whole parts of the bill and the policy memorandum where the language and the terminology it doesn't meet the standard that this parliament set in 2016. And that is of concern of us. We, we are the sort of guardians of the National Crim uh, Community Justice Scotland strategy. So therefore, that's the language that we take forward that all services use, including the police, when we refer to those that have convictions or those who have um, behaviours in a particular way. So it's disappointing that the language is in a particular way, that the terminology is in a particular way. We have had discussions with Scottish Government about why that language was used. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a hesitation because they're referring back to the 1974 Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, which is an act of Westminster. And the terminology there is from 1974. Um, it's not appropriate. And this Parliament said it wasn't appropriate so we have asked the Scottish Government to reconsider the use of the language specifically. And, and when in the policy memorandum it's talking about 
does this support individuals to move on? And that's the terminology that the Scottish Government uses. I would say language, terminology and the title of the bill are not sufficient. Examples of what isn't appropriate and what your regard is. So the use of the term offender or ex-offender is not helpful. So it's those who've had convictions, um, those with offending behaviour. Um, and that means an individual is, in, is empowered and isn't demeaned. And that, that's quite an important thing. So if you have been through a system, you've been through rehabilitation, but the Act still calls somebody who has a spent conviction an ex-offender. And that's not supportive in our view, um, and I don't think it was um, in, in the view of the Parliament in 2016, um, certainly in the discussions that were had, particularly in committee and in the chamber, that it was supportive of the direction that Scotland wants to take. So the 1974 Act, I think, is the culprit here, um, and the question is how appropriate is the use of replicating that language, either in the bill or the policy memorandum going forward, because it will create confusion for those who are sentencing, those in the police, uh, those in statutory services or the third sector. What do we call individuals? So in 2016, we had one idea, but now we seem to be going back. So that confusion, it's, it's something that we're not quite happy with, and we, we've been as firm as we can in the bill, but the title of the bill is confusing because this is about electronic monitoring, it's about changing of disclosure periods and the reform of the parole board. Um, we don't think it's about the management of offenders because somebody who has had convictions or a spent conviction is no longer an offender at that point. So it, that's where we feel it's misleading and it's unhelpful and possibly some of the language is pejorative as well. What you would prefer then is, or the language that's been... You, those, those, you who have, well, um, those who've had convictions and those who've had offending behaviour. I think that's an, an important one. It's about getting the terminology right and not going back to the 1974 Act, which is just not appropriate. And it's not what we do in Scotland. Okay. Just to follow up on that then, I mean, I suppose this is a question that probably would be more appropriate for those that drafted the bill in the first place. But I, when you put those concerns forward, I mean, is there something that says that it has to relate back to that Act and we therefore have to use that language? Or is that... Do you get the impression that's still something that's open to, to change or some sort of flexibility? I think you would have to ask the, yeah. the bill team um, for that. We did ask the question. It is um, a reserved Act of Parliament from 1974, so there are certain sections that they can't change and, and they have to approach right, okay. Westminster to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there was also another element in the evidence from Community Justice Scotland and it, where you say there's inconsistencies and ambiguities between the stated intent and the policy memorandum in the bill regarding written reports by criminal justice social work and where it states that written reports must be placed before the court, whereas that's not explicitly referenced in the bill. It was just to hear a bit more about those concerns too. It, it's when you have should in a bill or a policy memorandum but the actual explanation of that is not as um, well defined um, and it was to make sure that, that that section and the intent of it is clearly defined by Scottish Government um, because the, there seems to be different forms of drafting um, and the word should or must needs to be replicated or defined and that didn't, um, we didn't feel it was replicated from the policy memorandum itself. Okay. Um, and I just have one final question, and this was mainly from the evidence that we, the written evidence we'd received from Women's Aid, uh, where they talk about the 2015 evaluation into the presumption against short sentences, and they had a concern that offences that were committed um, uh, by offenders didn't constitute a breach of the of the CPO, uh, and that the response to breaches were uh, of CPOs were fairly inconsistent and quite poor as well. I'm just wondering what your experience of that would be or if that was something that you agreed with. You're correct that um, if somebody commits a, an offence during the period that they're on a community payback order, that does not constitute a breach of the order. Um, you can agree or, or disagree with that. That's the current legislation. Um, in terms of how breach is dealt with, um, it's been referenced earlier, I think, breach of any order, any licence has to be dealt with um, very clearly, very strongly. There has to be consequences. 
Um, but it's the job of the criminal justice social worker to look at the evidence. Somebody may be well into their order or license um, and generally making good progress and there's good evidence base for that. Um, and somebody then go through the, goes through a difficult period. You need to assess that, um, to look at the reasons for that. Why has that happened? Um, are, does that raise that individual's risk? Does it raise the risk to, to potential victims? Um, and then you make your decision and take the action accordingly. Where somebody has, has quite clearly breached in a significant way and there's a real increase in risk, um, then the social worker can, can go immediately to breach um, and, and take that back to court. Um, that's not instant because it doesn't obviously come with the power of arrest. Um, certainly in my own authority, and I'm sure this happens in other local authorities, where you have concerns about an individual, you will have that discussion with the court and say, Mr. or Miss X or whoever, uh, there are real issues here, we're going to be submitting a breach, can you make sure that this is dealt with very quickly? And that can mean that that case is called the next day or as quickly as the court can, can manage in terms of its timetable. So there is a way to, to shorten the period, otherwise if it's a, a normal breach that can take some weeks to get before the court and clearly that would not necessarily be, be very helpful and protective of, of communities and victims. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam Kerr, you had started on non-compliance. Did, did these questions um, answer the, the points you had? Yes, absolutely. I think Mr. Maybe was going to say something in response, though. I, I, was, I was just going to, to say, in terms of language, I think Mr. Blair has, has, um, has been very clear, and, and I would support much of what he said. I think one thing I would like to add around language is that it has to be, it has to be understandable to, to the public. Um, and I think there's a real issue uh, in, in Scotland in people's understanding of community payback orders, of the variety of prison licences, extended sentence, supervised release orders, in terms of what they mean. And I think that, that lack of clarity, that lack of understanding, because sometimes these are not couched in plain language, um, creates this sense of, um, of unknowing. And, and, and that, I think, leads to some of the, the issues where communities... Um, don't have faith or, or, or almost get to a default position where saying, well, if somebody's in prison, we understand that. They can't do any, any harm to anybody because they're in prison. So I do think it's really important that uh, all agencies uh, do what we can to explain to the public better what, what, we, what we do, be that Scottish Prison Service, be that my own service, be that Community Justice Scotland, so I think if we improve the common understanding of how we manage people who have offended or whatever the choice of, of, of term is, then I think we have a greater prospect of increasing people's confidence in what we're trying to do because they'll understand better why we, we think it's better to manage somebody in the community who would otherwise have got a short-term prison sentence where, let's be honest, nothing is going to happen with that individual. They will go into prison for two, three, four months. Um, Scottish Prison Service do not have the resource to, to do much with that, that person. They will then come out. Um, they will not necessarily be subject to any supervision and there's an opportunity lost. But if, we don't, if we're not clear about what we're doing, how we're trying to do it, um, and there is that common understanding, then I think you know, there's a risk that, that um, we don't do as well as we could do some of the things that, that we wish to try to achieve. Thank you. Jenny? Wiener. Um, James, maybe I'm sure I heard you say earlier on it's not just about the money. Um, so I'd like to go back to, to that point on resources because um, in your submission you talk about CPOs being one of the most commonly used community services uh, sentences rather in Scotland with over 19,000 in 2016 uh, 17 issued. Um, and you say an increase in the use of electronic monitoring would involve justice social workers carrying out more suitability assessments and supervising more monitored people. Um, with regards to resources, then, you go on to say that in this event, adequate funding would have to be provided. Can you be quite specific in terms of what resources you think are additionally required as it currently stands? Well, currently, um, in the current legislation, if, if the court make a standalone RLO, um, they're not required, for example, to get a criminal justice social report. Now, I think, the, in actuality, probably most courts will ask for a, for a report because they'll want that wider assessment. So we may see an increase in, in requests for reports because if somebody is going to get a CPO and EM is being considered as a requirement, then 
there would need to be a, a criminal justice so short report for that um, in terms of the the evidence that's been put forward um, is based on, on on the average length of a of CPO being 15 and a half months I think it is um, again that's an assumption it may prove to be correct it may not um, we may see longer orders um, for CPOs where there's an electronic monitoring requirement um, in respect of GPS that's a bit of a step into the unknown um, because you can have active GPS, you can have passive GPS. If you have active GPS where somebody is being monitored in real time and that information has been constantly fed back to the electronic monitoring provider, um, you would expect there to be much greater need for liaison and communication between EM provider and criminal justice social work. That potentially could be quite resource intensive. Um, and I think that needs to be considered and not forgotten about. Um, with passive GPS, that perhaps is less risky um, because it, obviously the data is aggregated over a particular period of time and then considered. Um, so I think that there are a number of unknowns um, and I think the word possibly is used in our submission. So whilst we think it's a reasonable um, first go at coming to some sort of... Um, quantifying to some extent what the cost might be. I think we, we do have to remain cautious um, that we get this right and that whatever legislation is, is enacted at, you know, at the end point, that we do monitor the impacts of that. There may be the opportunity to do that through demonstration projects um, before we, we get to doing it you know, across the country. Um, but I would just, I think it would be regrettable if criminal justice social work is not sufficiently resourced to deliver electronic monitoring um, in the way that we're discussing because it is such a, a huge opportunity. Okay, thank you. Ben. Thank you, Dweener. Good, good morning, panel. I'd like to move on to the disclosure of convictions uh, aspect of the bill. Karen McCluskey, uh, in your previous role with the Violence Reduction Unit with John Carnahan, you <coughs> spoke very powerfully and, and, and passionately about uh, people being able to move on once once their convictions have been spent. And I wondered what impact do you think convictions uh, have on people seeking to move away from previous offending? And the bill seeks to make changes to the rules on when convictions become spent, reducing the length of time in some cases and extending the length of custodial sentences covered by the provisions. Do the provisions achieve an appropriate balance in your view or is there more consideration that needs to be given? It is the most confusing act. I think for, the, for people who have convictions, I think un understanding when they should disclose and when they shouldn't, I think my experience is that people just end up disclosing everything. At the moment, it is keep, keeping them in structural inequality. The majority of the people who I work with and indeed James will work with have children, have families. They also need the opportunity to become part of the Wealth Creation of Scotland to get into employment. I know that if I get anybody, male or female, into employment, they have, you know, they will reoffend less. They will be able to earn square money for their families. They will be able to support them. And at the moment, that is not happening. There is often a blanket policy by lots of companies, and I can understand why. They've got like lots and lots of applications, and they're just sifting people out. And so it, it does need to be changed. I think it is much clearer. I welcome it. It's, um, you know, I mean, it absolutely reduces the terms. And for lots of the people with convictions that I've spoken to just now, you know, they're at least excited that there is some, you know, it, it's clearer about when and when they should not have to disclose their convictions. But there's, there's little doubt, I think, you know, we can't disaggregate some of those who are in structural inequality and, and how people disclose their convictions. And it may have been 10, you know, 10 years ago, they may be long away from their offending behaviour and they're still having to disclose it every single time they go into university, they go into, you know, anything. That seems, that seems particularly unfair. I agree. And do you think, so as drafted, do you think the Act, uh, sorry, the Bill uh, at present is uh, a, a step forward or are there other, other points oh, about it, it you'd like to It's read? definitely a step forward. 
It's definitely a step forward. I, th I think it will be interesting to see how we then communicate it to those who are trying to navigate their way through this, because it took me a number of reads and indeed the policy memorandum to try and understand lots of it. So it will be how we communicate it to those out there who have perhaps convictions from a long time ago and, and how they then understand what they have to disclose, when they have to disclose and, and who has got the right to ask. So, did yeah, I, I think that the, the changes in the disclosure periods are the, the start of a process. What the bill doesn't cover is how we do that. Now, there are processes out there via Disclosure Scotland and then asking for a summary application from a sheriff, but there are resources attached to that that those who've had convictions could not afford, and we're talking, in order to get the legal support to do that, thousands of pounds. So why, why would you go through a, a process where at the end of it you have to find the resource for it, but also a sheriff could turn down the application? So it, as Karen has said, um, we are supportive of the timeframes that are, are being spoken about, but it's more about informing the public, it's more about informing employers and those in education. Um, what does it mean to have this on your disclosure? Um, how can a person have that removed um, so that the anxiety around convictions for everyone in society, we can work on that. And as far as I can see, that anxiety is still there and there is a confusion um, which I, I don't believe that this Act supports. It doesn't support making it clearer for, for those who are involved in looking at the convictions. So maybe think forward, I think it is incredibly confusing. Um, I would suggest that... Incredibly confusing as things are, sorry to interrupt, but just... Yeah, so, the, yeah the, current, okay. um, the current situation, um, and I think the, the bill does take us you know, in the right direction. And I think it would be important, I mean, we've talked about language at, at points this morning, um, to run this past people who have convictions, who are going to be applying for jobs, um, to actually see if they understand what's being proposed, and the same with employers. Um, because if we don't, we run the risk of perhaps improving things for ourselves, but the people actually going to be dealing with this on the cold face, you know, applying for jobs, thinking about, do I disclose, do I not, what do I say, how do I say it, um, and the same for employers. So there is perhaps a litmus test that we can apply to, to trying to get the language right, so that uh, to maximise the, the potential for people to understand what it is uh, we're trying to achieve. Thanks very much, all. Thank you, Convener. OK, um, moving on to Liam MacArthur. Just following up on that, I mean, I think you've talked about a step in the right direction and, and removing um, uh, some of the, the lack of clarity there is at, at the moment. I mean, is there anything that you think we could be doing in the, in the context of um, scrutinising and amending this bill that would take us further along that, uh, that process to provide um, additional clarity, um, not just to, 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 to those who are, are caught by it, but as, as you rightly say, employers who, who may need to have a, 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 as much of a common understanding as possible about, um, about the way the Act is likely to impact. It, it is my understanding that some of these areas are reserved, so if it's an employment matter, it might not be appropriate for the Scottish Government to take forward. Um, now, I understand with other Acts of Parliament bills that have come through the Scottish Parliament where there are reserved matters, but it supports the individual at the end of the process, then in the guidance, things have been worked on to highlight issues so that you can see a clear process through to the end. I, I don't think, as it stands, it is supportive, and there are colleagues who will give evidence later on this issue. Um, the problem is the 1974 Act, and, and let's be frank about it, it's been changed quite a few times, um, and I'm not sure how supportive this is to, for individuals to understand. What we would um, call upon Scottish Government is to co-produce the guidance around this so that uh, in the implementation stages, uh, whether you're an individual, um, whether you're an employer or you're in education or you're providing services as well, so it's about volunteering, that there is a clear understanding of what the process is involved and what does it mean to have that conviction listed on your disclosure statement and it also says that you can work with um, anybody. Uh, what does that mean? Because an employer might see that uh, with the anxiety as too much. Um, so 
I think we need to work in co-production, but I'm not sure this, this bill is the right area to, to do that, unfortunately. I think well, it's the 1974 uh, Act. Although, Karen McCluskey, earlier on, you were, you were saying it took you some time at wading through um, the, the, the documentation around this bill to understand precisely what the implications were being. So, uh, that in of itself, as, as somebody who's, who's, um, uh, who's reasonably familiar with, with, with dealing with documents of this, of this type, that's a concern, is the way in which it's, uh, it's, it's phrased within the, the, the bill and, and supporting documentation as clear as it might be. When I speak to both my English colleagues and up here, we recruit with conviction and indeed positive prison, who I'm sure we'll speak later on, I think it's a question we get asked most. When do I have to disclose? Who do I have to disclose to? Can people ask me? Um, I think it will, be the, the, it will be the documents that we put out afterwards which will try and make sense of what is something that is really very complex, and particularly if you have more than one conviction or mixed convictions. I think that's where the confusion, you know... The confusion will lie, and certainly for employers as well. Employers don't know how to work their way through this, so we have to make it much simpler um, for employers as well. Otherwise, we risk excluding lots and lots of our, you know, sometimes quite vulnerable populations um, from a work environment, and, and that doesn't seem to be incredibly progressive. I don't know if there's anything that so maybe you want to add to that, or. Just to really echo, I think that the sentiments have been well made. Um, in, in Highland, we have a contract with Apex Scotland, and they run a course specifically on the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, because it is complicated. Um, and that covers not just the, the technical aspects of what you need to disclose and when, but obviously how you, how you deal with that with a potential employer, how you might answer questions if that's raised, um, I guess. If we were really successful, we wouldn't need to run a Rehabilitation of Offenders Act course because people would mm -hmm. pick it up and understand it. Um, so Social Work Scotland think we've made a giant leap forward in terms of the, what's laid out in the bill, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure there is a further room to, to, to improve things in the future. And just turn very briefly to the issue of um, the length of time for disclosure, obviously, um, is, is determined by whether or not the conviction happened um, before or after the age of, of 18. Uh, I'm not going to ask you whether you think that's, that, that's right, but I, probably more a question as to whether you think that's the, the right threshold um, to, to, to set in terms of making the distinction. <coughs> That's a, that's a really difficult one. I, I actually think they've taken a very pragmatic approach to this right now, but I don't think that doesn't mean that we don't revisit it in the future. Absolutely for some of our young people, we should not be holding them back for, you know, for circumstances that happened when they were under 18. And I deal with a lot of young people who are, whose lives are pretty much blighted. So I think it's a good place to start. I think we should consider it later on. Offending and victimisation are often fleeting and not a consistent state. We have some prolific offenders and absolutely that's why we need custodial environments and we need to deal with them in a different way. But we should allow people to move on and particularly those who, who, are, who, are, who are young and who have you know, decades and decades left to contribute to society. And so we, on that basis, um, do you think the bill as it currently stands and uh, allows that sort of change to be made in due course if that was felt to be appropriate? Or Well, I don't, I'm sure they can make uh, um, amendments to it later on, but I mean, I think it's a pragmatic approach. I mean, certainly the under-18s, you know, I mean, they have consulted, I think they've consulted on it at the moment, um, and I've not seen all the responses yet. If it was um, predatory behaviour and sexual offences that the someone under 18 wants, would you be recommending a cha change of policy? Well, I think that will be dealt with differently, won't it? Mm. I'm not sure. I think that will be dealt with differently. Mm. In any case. In any case. Right. So I, I'm not. So I, I'm. I'm not prevaricating, but I'm just not clear. It, I get feeling that would be to, that would be dealt. Seek, uh, yeah, that would be seek. dealt with differently. Uh -huh, clarification on that, because that's behaviour that is likely to continue. Sorry, I uh, understand. Two of. schedules for convictions: those of uh, higher nature and those of a lesser nature. And so this this is not uh, about that type of offence. So, right. th so this is about the the lesser. Right. So it wouldn't be covered. That wouldn't be a problem. Uh, not that I see at the moment, no. Mm -hmm. 
Liam Kerr. Very briefly, if I may, the, the, you were asked by Liam MacArthur about the, the length of time for disclosure. Uh, it seems to me you can't set an appropriate time period. You can't say what is an appropriate time period uh, unless we're absolutely clear on what we're trying to achieve through the disclosure. Uh, so if I can just ask a very kind of base question. Um, there must be a purpose to disclosure. There's a reason that we have a disclosure period at all. What do you understand that purpose to be? Well, I mean, there are certain jobs where you will always need to disclose your previous convictions, working with children, working with vulnerable groups. Yes, but and the I base think level disclosure. So is it a warning to employers that this person has been had a conviction in the past and therefore has a propensity to re-offend, for example? I'm not sure that that's clear. You know, just because you've offended in the past, you've got a propensity to re-offend, and particularly well, if you're further away from it. You know, I mean, we know that. I mean, there's a huge evidence base. Beth Weaver has just done a, a, a big um, survey of all the um, literature that's out there. If you've not offended for 10 years, if you've got nothing in between, your, your, you know, your likelihood of re-offending is no greater than mine. So I think that you know, there's a good deal, deal of evidence base to say that if you've got, you know, if it's a long time ago the likelihood of people re-offending is much less. What is the purpose? That's a really good question around what the actual purpose of disclosure is. I mean, we've set, I mean, we've set some, some times down there, but it will be individual. I'm not answering your question very well. I know I'm not. OK. Can you give me some time to think about it? Yeah. Sorry. I think I, I'm going to as well. I think it's a fascinating no, I, thing. I do why think do we it's do a, this it's a at really all? good question about why we think, you know, hmm. that we're telling, you know, of something that has been a very long time ago. If we, if we go back. Find information Absolutely. after you, you've been to the panel. It, it, uh, it was, and I think the basis in 1974 was because people weren't actively disclosing and there was confusion. Um, so it's, it's, I think part of it is public protection. Um, it, originally, but from this bill, I, I can't see if there's an answer for that. And it, it, this is just about the time periods. It's not about the reasons for disclosure. Mm -hmm. Could we muse on that and, and come back? Because yeah, great question. I'm genuinely really interested in that. Uh, Mr. Maybe, did you want to ask something? I'm not sure I can, can <laughs> provide any greater clarity than, than my colleagues, other than to say, I, I suppose from a... Uh, the obvious comment is that it's about the, the nature and the seriousness of the offence and whether that makes that individual uh, less or greater a risk to a potential employer. Um, hence, a sort of graduated scale of, you know, of periods of, of disclosure. Um, but it is a... Right. Then has there been any analysis done on which specific crimes have a greater or lesser pr propensity to re-offend? I don't know because the Because that would directly dictate the appropriate period for disclosure, one would have thought. Uh, is that a question for Scottish Government, uh, as they decided on the, the periods involved? Perhaps. And, and I, I presume it was evidence-based. I, I know there was a co-productive process with a working group, um, and they based their, their periods on, on that evidence. So I, I would ask the Scottish Government that question. I think that, that's more appropriate for them. All right. Thank you. Okay, but Rona. Yeah, just to continue the theme of difficult questions, um, <laughs> do you have any views on what might be done about the potential availability of information relating to previous convictions, including spent convictions um, appearing on the internet? Oh, grief. <laughs> the, right the, right the right to be forgotten. The right to be forgotten. I think um, we'll go back to 1974. We didn't have the internet. And um, what applied in 1974 you know, it was newspapers disclosing. Um, so I think we need an examination of this, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. I can't see from any of the bill documents that it, it actually addresses this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a good discussion for, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So there's been two cases um, just recently in England of a businessman who has just, I think it's Google, who have, who have just asked for the removal of documents and the right to be forgotten. Now, he, his was upheld. Um, somebody else was, was rejected. So I think we're in new territory now. Yes. I mean, it's, it's yes. difficult. You know, you've got, you've got this, and then you've got the, the touch of your fingers. And, you know, I mean, you'll have court documents, you'll have, you know, reports in the newspapers. 
That's a really difficult yeah. area. And that, that also, people will then think, should I just disclose? Because actually it's on the internet anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's how appropriate is it to disclose? If it's, is it relevant to the employment um, that you're applying for? Um, and is it a spent conviction? Have you asked for it to be removed? Can you get it removed? How relevant? Mm -hmm. There is a confusion about the appropriateness of it, and it is creating an anxiety um, around uh, convictions. So mm -hmm. how appropriate it would be now? Mm. I suppose there's nothing to stop an employer actually Googling the, the well, applicant or, for, you know. For applications to Disclosure Scotland, I think a good number of them are, are, are on, uh, the answer is, it, it's just disclosed. Yeah. Um, so um, it's a very difficult one. Um, mm -hmm. I think it needs more thought um, by Scottish Government. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask you another question? And apologies if you've answered this in a previous um, question, just for clarification. The Bill doesn't seek to make any changes to the arrangements under which spent convictions may be revealed under higher level disclosure checks, although the possibility of reform um, could be revisited later. Are you content with that, um, the fact that that, that level of check isn't going to be altered? I don't think we've previously commented on this, so... Yes, we're, we're content with uh, the you, you, high level. You are to, content, yeah. yeah. Obviously, we see the, the reason and the value yeah. and the purpose of that. OK, that's great. Thank you. Okay. And, Morris, I don't know if your question has been... Well, it, it has been asked partly. Can I just add one bit to that? Um, I, I pick up the bit on the, in the bill which talks about the armed forces, if I may refer to that, and, uh, and the alternatives of prosecution. Um, obviously, it is a reserve matter on Ministry of Defence, and therefore it could be seen as discriminating in, in Scotland because we're having more service men and women coming to live in Scotland. We already have them now into the tax, the new tax system. Um, what's your views on that? I mean, is this going to create a problem? Have they really addressed that when they looked at this bill? We have not responded to that issue. It's not really within our remit, I'm afraid. So we, we haven't commented on that. Do you see it as a, an issue that Coming down the line? I, I, I'm not able to give an answer to that one. Right. Can I just say that um, I work a great deal with, um, with the Army in Scotland. Mm. I now deal with a lot of servicemen who are now in the criminal justice service system. I would like to see it changed. I think it's, you know, we've got a two-tier system mm -hmm. here. Um, exactly. It seems inherently unfair. Right. But that is a personal view. Mm. That is a personal view that you've got a two tiers. Yeah. Mr Maybe, your comment on that? I don't think Social Work Scotland commented on that in our, in our response, but uh, I, mean, I would echo with that. I think we should always be trying to seek a level playing field, and wherever there is a, a two-tier system, we should, we should yeah. seek to try to address that. Thank you, Convener. Can I just ask the, the panel, electronic monitoring can be used for disposals from children's hearing systems. Are you familiar with that, and should that have been included in the bill? Are you aware that it is used just now? In yes, I, I read the response from the, the children's hearing reporter. Uh -huh. um, we don't have a comment on that. Um, no I, view I think, one way or another? No. I, I think there are better people more suited to responding to that. And Mr Maybe, do you have any? Um... I would respond similarly. I would, I would rather not um, try to formulate a response on that um, yeah. at this point in time. And just finally, um, in the policy memorandum, uh, it's possible for Scottish ministers to add to the list by way of regulation. Do you have any concerns about that? Stated in our response that any changes in power should be brought before the Parliament for discussion and approval um, so that uh, Scotland can debate this. Okay, and Mr. Maybe? Yes, I concur yeah. with that comment. Okay, and Ms. McCluskey, do you see? Uh, there, will, there will definitely be increase. Um, um, developments in technology as we go forward. We now have alcohol monitoring. We will have further monitoring as, um, you know, as technology gets much more sophisticated. And, and I think that was in there really just for you know, new developments in technology. And could I ask you just finally to uh, comment on the parole board, um, the changes to the composition and the new term of office? We, we chose not to respond to the parole board because it's another agency. So we were not able to respond to that. So you don't have a view at all on... No, we don't. Interesting. And our response was, was supportive of the um, information contained in the bill.
Okay, thank you very much. That concludes our questioning. Uh, can I thank all the witnesses for your evidence, which has been extremely helpful. I suspend now briefly to allow for a witness changeover and a five-minute comfort break.
I now welcome our second panel on the management of Offenders Bill, Professor Nancy Laux, um, Chief Executive, Family Outside, Pete White, Chief Executive, Positive Prisons, Positive Futures, Dr. Marsha Scott, Chief Executive, Scotland's Women Aid, and Nicola Fraser, Local Operations Manager with Victim Support Scotland. You're all very welcome, and can I thank you for your written submissions. I say to every um, set of panellists, it really is incredibly helpful to have that in advance of our formal panel session. Now, we've got um, our questions divided into two main areas. We're going to start with disclosure of convictions, and Ben, you've got the first questions. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, around the section on disclosure of convictions, I just wanted to ask, uh, similarly to the, the previous panel, what impact do you think convictions have on people seeking to move away from previous offending? And also, the bill seeks to make changes to the rules on when convictions become spent, reducing the length of time in some cases and extending the length of custodial sentences covered by the provisions. Do the proposals, as detailed in the, the bill as, as currently drafted, achieve an appropriate balance, in your view? And per perhaps Mr White first. Sorry, pardon me. Sorry. It's a step in the right direction, I think. And I think that the, um, the idea of um, people being able to work out what their disclosure period might be, or will be, is it's a lot clearer than it used to be. And I think it's going to help people uh, realise that they are on a journey back to being a contributing member of society, much more so than the current arrangements, which are highly complex and very difficult to uh, negotiate, especially if you're somebody who has maybe not had the best education or the best chances in life. This is a, better, a big step forward. I think there is scope for people being supported to work out how to disclose properly, and that, that is going to be a very important part of this. Uh, in the earlier session, we mentioned about employers being supported to recognise how to handle people uh, in the recruitment process with convictions. And there's an employer support network being set up um, by a collaboration across all sectors um, of em employers who currently do take on people with convictions to support others to follow their good example. I guess, just, just Sorry, uh, briefly, convener. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for Mr. White. And I just wondered if you, if you wanted to touch on what uh, the first point around what impact do you think convictions have on those people seeking to, to move away? Because I know that's something that your organisation is, is, is heavily involved in. And also, I note your point at 2.06 in your evidence submission about the need for publicity. And perhaps you'd like to elaborate on, on why you think that's important. Right, well, first of all, I apologise, apologies if I didn't answer the question correctly in the first time round. Um, I think yeah. helping people to move away from their offending behaviour, uh, whether it be through making sure they've got good accommodation, good access to medication and good access to welfare support, and once you get those three things in place and the prospect of being able to have a job is something that people can then build on. This uh, the proposal in the bill here, I think, um, is going to help that enormously. The good thing about that is that if people are able to negotiate and map out a way forward um, that is going to keep them away from offending, then it's going to be better for everybody involved. It's going to be less harm right across the board. And I think that this is definitely a step in the right direction. And, and the publicity point? The publicity it? side of things? Yeah. I fear that that's um, way beyond my understanding as to how we can uh, pull back what's already out there. Um, I wish it was the case that we could just at the end of a disclosure period, um, that these things would automatically be removed from the internet. But I don't believe um, that we currently have the technology available to do that, even though I, for one, would be very uh, appreciative if that could be the case. It's all too easy to Google somebody's name, and you may not get the right person, or you may not have the up-to-date information. I don't know. And a, a comprehensive campaign to inform employers about the new disclosure arrangements is, is, is so important in your view? It is, and that's, that's part of the process that's led to the setting up of the Employer Support Network. Working with the likes of Virgin Trains, Greg Bakeries and Timpsons, who all have good practices in place for um, how to recruit people, how to consider people with, with convictions in the recruitment process in a safe and well-managed way. Um, we want to spread the word uh, right across the board, not simply with the national, org, national employers, but small, medium, all sorts of employers. Um, It'll start on the 22nd of May as a reception here to promote this whole thing. 
Thank you very much, Professor Luke. I can respond just in relation to the impact of convictions, as I'm sure you're aware that the, um, Im the impact of convi convictions extends well beyond the person who's been convicted themselves. Certainly in terms of the stigma surrounding convictions and the publicity surrounding convictions can affect the entire family. It can affect, for example, their housing status. If it's, for example, if someone has been selling drugs um, from a particular premises, the entire family can be ev evicted, um, even if they had nothing to do with the, the actual offence. Um, obviously, it has implications as to where someone can return to after imprisonment as well. And again, that's something that affects the wider family, even though the family themselves have not been convicted of anything. Um, so that is a, is a frustration, but it's something that's to flag up the need to involve families in discussions surrounding what happens next. Absolutely. Th thank you, Camille. Okay. Thank you. Rona? Thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder if I could just ask the rest of the panel on, on your views on the problems with the internet and disclosure. Um, any thoughts on how we could, that could be tackled? <laughs> I think that's something that we raised within our written submission, that yeah. it's something that will need to be addressed. And as yeah. the previous panel said, it's, it's something that um, has, has come about after the, um, you know, subsequent to the, the previous legislation on this issue. So it is something that does, does follow people around. Mm -hmm. We have concerns as well about common practices such as publishing um, addresses of, of people with, with convictions. Because again, that's something that impacts on, on the whole family as well. Yeah. So it's, I, I, I don't have an answer for it, but it is mm -hmm. something that we definitely need to find okay. uh, some sort of response. Okay. Anyone else? Are, are you in agreement with that? We commented on, but yeah. it uh -huh. also does affect um, victims when court cases are heard and, and a lot of stuff can be put on the internet. So it is something that's very much new but needs to be addressed, yeah. seriously needs to be addressed. Okay, thanks. And just my other question is just about the, um, the fact that the bill hasn't made um, changes to the arrangements for higher level um, disclosure. Are you content with that or would you like to see that revisited at any time? Marsha? Surprisingly, I was quiet earlier. Um, because, in fact, we, we have fewer concerns than we might have because um, most of the convictions for domestic abuse would probably not be affected um, by these changes around disclosure. I, I do think we have some concerns which we laid out in, in our response, um, but I'll say now, and I'm afraid I'll probably repeat this a number of times over the rest of the, the panel session, is that it is really important that we are clear that both uh, that that um, violent crimes and, in particular, domestic abuse is a is a, a is a relatively anomalous um, crime in terms of victimization rates, re-victimization rates, and reoffending rates. And we need to be really careful that we take an evidence-based and an uh, equalities impact assessed process uh, approach to this. So um, uh, the I think, you know, as I said, we're very pleased that it doesn't uh, um, address the higher level disclosures, but we think there are some concerns, certainly around um, uh, some of the other possible um, extensions of the, uh, or changes to the time of disclosure that just need to be risk assessed carefully in the context of domestic abuse. Thank you. Anyone else? I think we've done very well with the changes uh, for the shorter sentences and I think that that will maybe in due course give us the opportunity to consider what would be appropriate for the longer sentences that are mm. not covered by this bill at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If I could just tease out the employment issue a little bit and maybe ask Nicola Fraser for victim support. We've covered um, unspent credentials doesn't mean that you know, the disclosure isn't, isn't supposed to make it that they're unsuitable for employment and they've talked about changes to terminology and anything else that could be done. Is there a view from victim support on, on this balance that has to be struck? Again, it's not something we actually commented on, yeah. but it is something that being in a volunteer sector, you're very aware of. Um, and I do think that there's a lot of misunderstanding in relation to when people should disclose and what they should be disclosing. Um, there are a lot of organisations that are still out there that just have a blanket, no, mm -hmm. um, we try, but we've got to, we're dealing with very vulnerable people, as you understand, so again, it's, it's vital. But as they discussed earlier, it's very much based on what crime 
and what level of impact that might have if you're dealing with PVG or with vulnerable people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, you already mentioned that more awareness raising, some good examples from Virgin and from Timson. Is there anything else that could be done to, to help this problem? Well, I, I think that the, the employers are only part of the deal, to be honest. I think that people who are um, going through some punishment, whether it be in the community or in custody, I think they should be given some information and support to, to, to learn how to disclose appropriately and effectively. Right. I think that there's more to it than simply um, the employers. I also think that, um, in, in general terms, the public, um, the, the wider public, um, could benefit from understanding more about the direction of travel of disclosure and the way things are changing there. And I think that the, uh, the stigma that's attached to employers who employ people with convictions doesn't seem to have reached Virgin or Timpsons mm -hmm. or Greggs. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to spread, the, spread that feeling uh, much more widely. And Marsha or Nancy, any views on that at all? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That, any views on that? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I absolutely think that you know one one of the the issues for us, and I agree, is that um, the the people involved in the system, the victims, the children, the um, uh, need need to be much better informed. And 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 I re I heard the reference before about you know people who maybe haven't. Um, been lucky enough to have great education backgrounds. Well, I can't understand the rules, and I've had quite a good education background. So I, I think, um, you know, at, at some point we have to look at the outcomes of this. So we need to take a look at how how are people informed, and more importantly, what do we do with the information that they then give us in response? Yeah. And and in particular, in the context of domestic abuse. Um, it's important to talk to victims, uh, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because empirically they're the best predictor of further harm from the perpetrator. And so if we're not taking advantage of that data from them, when we do inform them about um, arrangements around uh, disclosure and, and other um, uh, arrangements around convicted offenders, then we're missing a trick in terms of good data. Okay, thank you. And Nancy? Underline that, that it's, um, it is something that we need to know what to do with that information once it is disclosed as well. It's not just, I, mean, I think I, I would say that we do have a lot more work to be done with employers, not just in relation to the ban the box movement and not having the tick box saying, do you have a conviction or not? But also if someone does disclose a conviction, really having a proper assessment as to whether that's relevant to the type of, of work they're applying for. Supplementary, Liam Kerr? I understand the point being made that uh, if there's a kind of tick box exercise, it can prejudice one's employment future going forward for quite some time. Uh, I have sympathy for that, but also I think some people might look at it and say, well, look, you have an employer who's trying to select from potentially a very large number of candidates. Uh, and I think some people would feel that it is appropriate to say, well, th these candidates don't have any convictions, whether spent or unspent. Uh, this candidate does, I need to somehow filter, these people have played the game, let's move them forward. Can you see that side of the? If you take the fact that, according to government figures, 38% of the adult male population has at least one conviction, and 9% of women, are you going to exclude all of them from potentially being recruited for a job? I don't think so. And I think that we need to be very careful how we... Um, respond to a conviction without an understanding of when it happened, what happened, and what has happened since then by way of the individual moving on. Just in the submissions that have been given, uh, it has been suggested by families outside in positive prison that we need to address the practice of employers asking about unspent convictions at the initial stages of recruitment. But, Mr White, isn't that you've just suggested that actually there needs to be a conversation, and actually far from ad addressing a practice of asking about it and stopping that, there needs to be a more open conversation where it's done up front. Is that what you're suggesting? I think that the way in which the recruitment process could be um, uh, set up to enable somebody to be seen as the person they are now, first of all, and whether or not they're suitable for the job, and if they are going to be into the situation where they're going to be offered a job, at that point, disclosure self-disclosure by the individual would be a good thing to do because they'll have seen the person, not the conviction, when it comes down to the recruitment process. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Uh, 
I was going to take us on to the disclosure of convictions. I mean, you, you touched earlier on about the additional clarity um, that you thought that the, that the bill brings in relation to when disclosure should and shouldn't happen. We heard in the previous, um, from the previous panel that this is going to be a tricky process, but hopefully through the guidance um, that, that uh, further progress could be made. I wonder if, whether, whether there was any thoughts that any of you had about uh, improvements that might be made through, through the bill in terms of giving a greater degree of clarity, um, if not to, to employers, as we were suggested before, that this, this, this may be covered more by, uh, by reserved uh, legislation, but, but certainly for those um, being expected to disclose, and, and by extension those advising them, I suppose. Um, I, I hesitate to go first again. Um, apologies. Um, I think it would be possible to come up with some means by which employers, potential employers, friends, family and the individuals involved could put all the information about themselves relating to their date of birth, their convictions, when they were, and all that sort of thing, into a machine and it would come up with an answer as to whether or not you should, you should disclose or not disclose. We worked with a software engineering student from Napier and we got very close to this just in time for this new bill to come out to suggest that our figures might have to be changed. But I think to make it something that is not left to chance would be really, really good. And that's something that everybody could use, have it online, and they could check out for themselves. I think it would be a really good thing to do. As long as it wasn't left online. Sorry? As long as it wasn't left online. I'm sure we could sort that one, <laughs> thank you, yes. Any other views on that? In which case, turning to the issue of the um, distinction made in terms of uh, the time frames for disclosure, uh, depending on whether the conviction happened pre or post um, uh, an individual's 18th birthday. Again, I, I presume that's something that you would, uh, you would support, um, but whether or not you feel that's the, the, that is a suitable threshold. And again, I think taking into consideration the point made by the previous panel about um, a, a differentiation um, made between the, the higher tariff uh, convictions and, and, and the lower tariff convictions. Not our particular area of expertise, we didn't comment on that specifically, but um, it seems as reasonable a threshold as it, as it can. Uh, there will be a distinction between the more serious offences and the less serious offences. Um, as, as we go through this discussion, I'm, I'm, I was wondering if I could give an example of, um, it's not a families outside example, unfortunately, but I, I was a um, child protection officer for our local gymnastics club, um, and one of the um, training um, examples that Scottish Gymnastics gives is uh, a man who's a qualified coach who um, has a conviction on his record which stays on his record for life because it's a sexual offence. It was for um, sex with an underage uh, girl. But in looking at the detail of the offence, he was 16 years old, um, when that conviction went on to his record, his girlfriend at the time was 15. The mum of the girl was the one who brought the case to the police because she objected to the fact that they were, were sleeping together. The police had imposed a, a 50 pound fine, um, but unfortunately that is something that stays on his record forever. The, the, he and his girlfriend are now married and have four kids, and they're both excellent gymnastics coaches. Um, but it's the type of thing about looking behind the label and, and taking the time to look at the, at the detail and circumstances of the offence that most people just don't get that opportunity. Um, but it's something that stuck with me over, over time is something that can be scarring for, for life and can carry on someone's record without it necessarily being a risk to the public. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're now moving to the electronic uh, monitoring set of questions. Before I bring John Finney in, can I ask, there's a number of submissions where people have argued that electronic monitoring should be available as condition of bail. The government seems open to this. Could I have the panel's views? Nicola, would you like to start for it, Jane? It's an interesting aspect because um, a lot of victims really struggle with the issue of bail and bail conditions anyway. Um, I think the level of risk assessment necessary prior to releasing somebody on a tag for bail instead of remanding them is quite intense. A lot of conditions would have to be taken into consideration. And I think the things that I'm sort of thinking about is when it's that kind of crime where there might be a threshold between mm, custody or using tagging is we need to take things into consideration 
in, especially in Scotland, in sort of smaller towns, rural towns, these individuals are going to come into contact on a regular basis. You go to somewhere like Brechin, there's one co-op. So everybody does their shopping there. And that's the kind of things that you know, we need to take on board. You're talking about a victim that's just been traumatised. That person could appear in custody, be released on bail, and they're back. So there would need to be a lot of risk assessment done. There would also need to be huge ramifications if that person breached the bail or breached the tag, because community will never accept that unless they see that something happens when that person does it, breaks it. It's unclear from, from my understanding just what the ramifications would be for, for breach. It's very vague. Uh, any other um, comments from the panellists? Just to echo um, what Nicola has just said, um, we, you know, we really think that technology in this context, like pretty much every other context, can be a great boon and a great challenge. And um, it's about understanding the context. So um, uh, we would very much welcome, we, you know, we, we have concerns about um, uh, uh, accused being released uh, prematurely before risk assessment that's been done appropriately. And so I'm going to bang on that all along because there's a lot, there's a quite a thin evidence base around police risk assessment um, of uh, uh, domestic, an, in domestic abuse context. And while I think we need to use the tools that we have, there we really, really need to understand the role of professional judgment in, the, in these decisions. And, um, and professional judgment that's not competent around the dynamics of domestic abuse is very dangerous. So I guess what, what we want to underscore is there's not a yes or a no answer from our perspective in terms of use of electronic monitoring and bail, although we think it absolutely needs to be a, a, a possibility. Um, but the decision making around it is what's critical. And um, so, you know, not only do we need to pay attention, there's a, there's a piece of research going on right now down south in the College of Policing around police risk assessments. And I think we need to take some of that on board in terms of how we, we um, look at rolling this out and a number of other things around domestic, the new law, but also the breach, the, the breach issues are really going to be important. Pete? I think, uh, first of all, I agree completely that risk assessments need to be carried out um, very thoroughly and professionally, and that's an important part of the process. I also think when it comes down to uh, breach, I think there should be a zero tolerance approach in that case, because individuals who are under some kind of electronic monitoring need to know what the limits are. And um, I think I find myself surprised that I'm saying that, <laughs> but, but, but I also think it's really important that um, people uh, with um, the th a, a court case pending realise that it's a very serious matter and their conduct, um, if they are released uh, on uh, some kind of monitoring, is going to be part of, of their trial process effectively. It's, it's really got to be taken seriously. This, you know, if you breach this, you get this chance then. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Okay, and Nancy? I think I would actually connect our response to the response that we gave recently in relation to the use of remand um, generally is that um, I wouldn't necessarily say that electronic tagging is, uh, is appropriate for everyone who's remanded into custody, but it was looking at reasons why we remand people into custody, whether it's for people who don't turn up to court, for example, um, whether we could be ma making better use of things like supervised bail, which is used very inconsistently around the country. Um, so I would connect it to, to that conversation. Okay, and supplementary, Dan, before I bring in John. Uh, in fact, Professor uh, Nancy Luke's just, I think, touched on, on what my, my supplementary was going to be. I mean, I think public safety is, is one dimension as to why remand is used. You know, f flight and, and indeed just, frankly, reliability of the, the, the accused turning up at court or, or others. I was just wondering if, if the panel w w would agree that there are a number of considerations and, 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 and why electronic uh, tagging might be a, a good alternative to, to uh, remand. I think remand can be, um, or the tagging can be quite useful to where people have um, uh, particularly chaotic lives. I was at an event at, in Lanarkshire just last week where a young man was saying that he wished he could actually remain tagged. I thought that was a rather extreme response, but he was saying it was very helpful for him to create some sort of stability and, and, um, and, and predictability and accountability 
um, which he actually found very helpful, um, especially in terms of his trying to return to the community in, in his case. Um, but for remand as well, it's, it's being able to provide that, um, that structure. As long as it's ideally supported, you want to see that, that um, support attached to it rather than just purely surveillance um, to make it most effective. I think that there's great potential in people being able to um, not go to remand halls. The conditions under which people are kept um, are quite different from convicted prisoners. And I think the lack of structure and the lack of access to services for remand does nothing but damage to a large proportion of the people who are in there. And I think they would have a better chance of recovering their sense of being a member of society on a tag, much, much more so than if they're held in this limbo land that's remand. But I agree that risk assessments are vital. Thank you. Carter? I'm just trying to link back the, the, the comment that Professor Alex made there around the, the chaotic lifestyles that are involved very often. It's, it's a message we've heard through our inquiry on, on remand from, um, from most witnesses, in fact. Um, but trying to square that with Mr White's comment around almost a one strike and you're out uh, for breach, uh, I think as we heard with the previous panel, in a sense this could be a management process over a prolonged uh, period of, of different separate incidents. So I'm not quite sure how we, as I say, how we square um, the approach, Mr White, you were talking about breach and actually the characteristics that, that, that crop up very often with the type of people that we're, we're trying to keep out of remand and support into better behaviour. I just say for me it just underlines the need that um, surveillance on its own is not enough. It's having the support that goes with that and that's the support that can actually prevent breach in the, in the first place. Um, but I don't know if you want to add to that. The zero tolerance approach is one that I was encouraged to take on board by Karen McCluskey. And um, I wouldn't argue with her. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add that um, one of our big concerns around community disposals generally is is um, uh, a, a failure to act appropriately in response to um, breaches of the orders, and the and um, I think you know that this this leads back to that question about who's managing the orders and how much resource they have for doing that, how much training they have. Um, around particular areas, and also there are huge gender issues around who gets sent on remand and the impact of being held on remand. And I think um, uh, I, I would have a, a, I would urge the committee to be be mindful, which I suspect you already are, about um, the fact that the impact on women offenders around much of these issues is is hugely um, more harmful, and that that we need a justice system that responds to the, to the equality characteristics of both the victims and the offenders. And when we try to create responses that are not uh, nuanced in the, in the appropriate ways around equalities, we, we do great harm to both, I think. Okay, thank you. And John Finn. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, panel, we've touched on a couple of issues there, bail and, and remand, where y you see a potential for electronic monitoring. The, the position of it as a standalone measure was endorsed by the, a report from 2016, uh, and they commended its use in conjunction with other um, uh, interventions. Can you comment on when you think it would be appropriate to um, see electron electronic monitoring being used, please? This again connects to the discussion about the presumption against short sentences as well. It's, it's using it when it is something that can benefit from support within the community, whether there are um, addiction programs, mental health services, things they can access in, in the community without breaking the connections with, um, w with the supports that they might already have, um, the family connections, housing, employment potentially. These are all things that if someone is on a tag rather than sent into custody, they can at least maintain those, those structures that are more likely to keep them um, keep them from offending in future. Um, I think those are probably the, the main the main things I would I would point out. I'm happy to weigh in here. Um, again, electronic monitoring, you know, we think has has potential for improving the safety of of victims and their children. And um, uh, so we really support the use of it in that context. Um, we are mindful that 
many of the accused, um, more accused than we would like, are released um, into the community and um, in the context prior to trial, but also um, offenders out in the community um, with uh, under C with CPOs or or whatever disposals have been made that do not include custody, which and I'll just remind you that at the moment only one percent of convicted offenders of domestic abuse are sentenced to custody over a year. So we are talking about a lot of convicted offenders here. So if if and when electronic monitoring can be used to better um, manage their presence in the community and their um, expo you know, their danger to the women and children. We really like it. What we're concerned about is, again, the failure to understand a, a number of key things. One is that when, when victims and um, uh, abusers live apart, there is not additional safety. There is often additional risk in that context. And so the, the, the combination we find at the moment of the fact that people still suffer under this myth that separation equals safety, and when you combine that with some technical fixes like potentially like electronic monitoring, um, then you have a system that's far more confident about sa the safety of victims than it should be. So th th this again is about electronic monitoring is, a, is, a, is an opportunity, but it is absolutely critical that it be done with appropriate understandings of the dynamics of domestic abuse in the context of it. We're competing with some grass cutting outside. Uh, we're trying to get the window closed. It's done automatically downstairs. It may make a bit of a noise. So if we hear that, I may suspend briefly so that you're not blocked out by the noise of the window closing. So if we continue, and that's it, I think, now. <laughs> if we just continue then, if it's, if it's interfering with hearing people, then we can stop again. Right, where were we? John. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, another phrase that's come up um, in an earlier session that's been repeated again is the issue of support that would be required to underpin electronic monitoring. And indeed, um, the Scottish Government refers to it as a more person-centred and more fully integrated with other community uh, justice interventions. Do you view this legislation as going far enough in that direction of, uh, with reference to support? The current situation that we've got is that somebody's released on an RLO with absolutely zero supervision. Absolutely nothing. They've got no support, they've got no help, and they're out in the community. So any, th any form of supervision or support in respect of a tag is going to be beneficial. It's definitely going to be beneficial, whether it goes far enough um, is difficult to say because we have to take the victims into consideration um, because I think where we are currently, and it's probably quite harsh, is communities do not have faith in community sentencing. And that's because we've discussed it before. It takes too long to breach somebody. We're looking at zero tolerance. If you're on an RLO, you can have eight, nine breaches of 10, 15 minutes each. How long do we wait until it's breached? How many times do you stand outside that victim's house before you actually commit a breach? So it's the supervision aspect is to try and help them reintegrate into society and become more or less likely to reoffend. But it also has to be to support the victim to know that they're safe. So if that's the issue, is that had sufficient regard, if not directly in reference in the legislation and the supporting documents, the level of support, because it seems to be a recurring theme, no point in having the technology without the, the, the backup from humans. I, I just want to support um, uh, the reference to supervised bail. There's some really good evidence and, um, from the US in looking at at um, uh, really serious supervised bail um, uh, interventions around the context of domestic abuse, and they have really good outcomes in terms of reducing reoffending. My my sense is that that this would be a great opportunity to com to consider support also being the the expanded use of supervised bail. And also that feeds information into your system much faster and earlier about the likelihood of a breach. So. Uh, 
Dr Scott, is that covered by the, the supporting documents, this legislation, or is it just this passing reference to more people-centred? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, John. Well, I, I'm trying to understand if you believe that the resources that would support that approach, and we've heard in the previous panel that additional resources would be required, is there an acknowledgement, do you feel, from the Scottish Government in relation to that? We felt that the, um, the bill focused very much on the surveillance and security side of things without enough reference to the need for, for structured support um, to be available. It needed much more emphasis on that as, as a requirement, as, as a condition, and not just the, 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 the surveillance in itself. But it also requires a recognition that this support will not be universally available throughout Scotland. It might be more concentrated in urban areas, for example. Um, but without that support, you are going to face difficulties in, in compliance. I um, can give an example as well. It's not just about things like um, uh, addiction and, and housing and so on, which are the sort of standard ones, but also things like we had a call from a family that uh, had taken their, their daughter back home with them after her release on, on a tag, and the house was surrounded by drug dealers because they knew she was there. They were there to collect debts. They were there to try to get her to, 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 to resume her habit. And there was no um, you know, support for them to be able to deal with that, let alone the, the support that she needed to address her addiction in the first place. Just trying to make sure that's universally available if this is actually going to succeed as a, as a measure. Mr. Bank. I think that um, one of the benefits of support, it's not just the technical um, monitoring of somebody in discussion with them. I think the personal contact is something that's quite vital because it, there's somebody out there for somebody who's on their journey back um, who, can, who knows the full story, so there's no need to conceal or hide what's going on, and to develop a relationship, which is maybe the first positive relationship that person's had in a long time. And I think that's where the support thing is particularly beneficial. I think that the, the fact it's not clearly specified in this bill is good, because there's room for innovation and expansion and new things to come along which we can introduce without it being set down in a bill at the moment. Can I just add that um, I, I know that there are a number of pilots going on at the moment. They've just started not too long ago. Um, we have a commitment from uh, Justice to do a domestic abuse pilot around electronic monitoring because we were, we were convinced that we needed to ask some very specific questions about electronic monitoring. We're, we, we are convinced that there might be different outcomes of that kind of a pilot, depending on whether it was done in a very rural and remote area versus an urban area. Um, and I think that the question of resources is a really good one, and um, that I agree that the bill sort of leans towards a, a let's, let's have a tech fix, um, rather than let's figure out what the resources would be need would be to make the technology work the way we want it to. But I don't, th I, I don't think that you know, that's not possible still. But I think it's really important that we be careful not to make decisions about the implementation of electronic monitoring until we have some of this information. Um, uh, uh, and also, short sentences, I have to say, um, until we have the information from these pilots. And Will you be able to furnish the committee with information about these pilots, please? Well, it, the Scottish, the Justice Department is doing the pilots, um, so they're the ones that should be providing that information. Um, okay. And uh, we'll be, we're meeting with them actually in a couple of weeks to talk about the domestic abuse one. Okay, thank you very much. Name MacArthur supplementary. It's just on the back of the discussion there around uh, resources and the additional resources that may be required to um, support the wider use of electronic monitoring. Do you think there's been enough of a, 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 an assessment of the resource shift? If we're, if we're trying to keep people out of remand, um, then presumably um, one would need a, a resource to shift from what's going into remand at the, at the moment to more community-based um, measures at a, at a local level. Is it your impression that that, that debate has been had, that the, that the government has a, a clear view as to how they might manage this, this budget shift? I don't think there's been a, an active debate um, of sufficient depth and extent uh, as yet to do with this, but I think that the, the general feeling uh, for the people I represent is that if people can be helped to not be in prison, then further down the line that's going to save a lot of money. And I think the budgeting side of things is, not, is seen in too short a time frame at the moment. And I think if there's some investment in helping people to um, 
start their journey back to being a, a constructive citizen without going to prison, then that's going to save a lot of money further on. That's the distinction. You, you, you wouldn't necessarily foresee a, a, a short-term shift in, in budget. It's more likely to be a kind of medium-term uh, calculation that's made that would allow that, that resource to be freed up and, and moved into, into other measures. I'd like to think so, yes. Right. I have a possibly slightly con contrary opinion, which is I think we need to be really careful if we're, if we're not, if we're, if we're shifting into the community folks who are ordinarily would be in remand and have strong concerns about the use of remand, so I want you to hear that in this context. But um, we need to be really careful that we are not shifting the task for supporting victims um, and their children to the, the organizations like our domestic abuse organizations, Women's Aids, um, to be advocating for safety in the context of new technologies when, um, when you know, a they, a, they don't have any more training than anybody else around the, the use of the technologies and also are, are um, uh, stressed by local budget cuts. So I think there needs to be a, a, a careful analysis of, w of where support is going to come for victims in the, f in the face of, cha of system change and making sure that we um, support that, not just with mine, but, you know, with other victims' organizations. Nothing else to add? That's fine. Uh, Daniel now, followed by Morris, then Rona. So I think the discussion over the last few questions has been very interesting. I think it, it hits upon, I think, the, 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 sort of the, the central tension within this, which is fundamentally what uh, increased use of electronic uh, monitoring could and should be about is about taking people who would otherwise be in prison and providing them with, with the opportunity of, of uh, being outside however that comes with risks I think is the I think that the, the broad summary so can I just look at that in a little bit more detail risk assessment has been discussed by by Marcia Scott earlier and indeed in our previous uh, evidence session we, we heard that the, the view that there needs to be kind of improvement of uh, in terms certainly in terms of clarity around risk assessment and indeed the call that perhaps um, courts should provide uh, a, a, an evidence summary so that, and, and I think that hits upon the, the support point, that in, if you want to provide the right support to individuals, that risk assessment is, is clearly critical. I'm just wondering if the panel would agree with that call uh, for that, that summary to be provided, uh, and indeed what other requirements would you like to see in terms of risk assessment just to, to, to strengthen this sort of central uh, tension? Uh, maybe uh, Pete White, first of all. Um, I think um, it's very dangerous territory for me to start thinking about what happens in a courtroom. And, and I, th I think that the, um, I would like it to, to be standard that the sheriff or judge is required to read social work reports before they sentence. I think that's an important part of this. And I think that the, the idea of a risk assessment being carried out before somebody is found guilty is quite a difficult one. Um, if it's going to be a choice between custody and community at that point, um, if that's within the frame of the offence that's been committed. But I think that the um, risk side of things needs to be balanced very carefully. I, I'm well aware of the needs to look after the rights of uh, victims of crime and other people in the community. But I think also we need to be really sure that we're putting somebody into the community knowing that the chances are very, very strong that with the right support, they will not offend again. But I think that the, um, the summary of evidence, I think is a crucial part of that. I'm just wondering if other panelists would agree with that. Can I ask, mention something about what type of risk we're actually talking about assessing as well? Because I think there's a tendency in a risk assessment to focus on the risk to the public, the risk of reoffending, which is perfectly understandable. But I think there are wider questions that need to be asked in terms of what the impact of tagging, for example, means on the rest of the family, on, on the context. So if you're talking about someone who's being tagged um, to... Uh, to their home, um, the research that we have seen. It's a very new field of research, but we do know that it tends to mean the rest of the family tends to become isolated themselves because they are left with the almost kind of policing role of making sure the person is com uh, complies with the conditions of their, of their tag. 
It can mean that if, if, if the person who's on the tag can't go out, then the rest of the family won't go out either. Um, but we also see things like, for example, if the offence is unrelated to a domestic abuse offence, but there is an abusive relationship, there's no, that's not part of the risk assessment. Um, that, that, that needs to be asked. We need to be asking about, um, about the wider context and the impact on, on the family when these types of orders are made. Can I just, uh, just to sort of give an example, we, we come across um, individuals on quite a regular basis. It's usually for HDC, but it can be for tagging as well. When that person goes through the court system and they give a bail address, it's usually checked by the police as being au fait. Once they're going to be tagged, then it's supposed to be that that address is checked, that that's going to be compatible and that the individuals are happy with that. What we then get is that family member on the phone going, I couldn't say no, I'm terrified of them. How can I say no? Now that's where the risk assessment needs to be yeah. because an awful lot of these people you find are grandparents or extended family, because the family's already gone, do you know what, you're not coming home, I've been through that. So it's very important that the level of risk is taken for that family. The other thing, just as you said, is you've got 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. curfew, mm -hmm. so you can't go out, so everybody comes to you. Yeah. And that's the biggest issue that families have. They've then got all these people at their house and there's no escape. Thank you very much. I think that really brings to life kind of the, 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 the broad spectrum that risk assessment needs to take. C can I just also just uh, look at an, another point? I think Marcia Scott, Scott raised something I think is quite interesting because I think it is one of the, 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 the controversies in this. You, you discussed the possibility of electronic tagging uh, improving um, the, the sort of CPOs and in, in, in terms of uh, you know, providing assurances for people given those sorts of sentences. Now that's interesting because I think that's actually potentially quite controversial. I mean, I think there's been a number of submissions where people have highlighted, in particular the Howard League, that, 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 that what they're concerned about is that, that, that this isn't used to essentially add on or increase um, sentences for people that would otherwise be at liberty and, and not in prison. They want this to be focused on uh, in, uh, providing new opportunities for people who otherwise would be in prison. I was just wondering how, what your, your, how you would reflect on that and maybe how other members of the panel would reflect on that point. I'm going to bang the same drum, which yeah. is domestic abuse is different. And, sure. and, um, and a failure to flag that up, to highlight that, considering that it's 25% of our police business and, or 20% and 20% of our, of our Crown Office business, um, uh, would be a hugely um, risky uh, mm -hmm. move. I do think it's really important to think of electronic monitoring in both the post, the pre and the post conviction, conviction settings. But I also think it, it also needs to not, um, not be an easy answer. So I, I have sympathy with the Howard League's position, but I also, again, you know, Crime is not a homogenous thing, and we can't. And and offending is not homogenous, and offenders are very different in um, in the context of domestic abuse. So I, it has to be appropriate for the context. And if we can't find a way, if you can't find a way, to create a bill that is sufficiently flexible so that we protect victims of domestic abuse and sexual assault um, at the same time that we are creating a, a society that allows people to move on from other kinds of crimes, then, then, we, then it's not right and it has to be redone. Is that, you yeah, know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, because I guess another way of putting it is that it can actually do both. It can Im improve existing, um, you know, community orders as well as providing opportunities which don't currently exist. Would that be a sort of a fair... I agree. Uh, and that's, I think, what we said in our thing. And I'm just going to take a moment to add one quick thing, which is a bit the elephant in the room around criminal justice, social work from a domestic abuse perspective, which is that we have the Caledonian program, which is a perpetrator program, and everybody wants to have something that will fix perpetrators of domestic abuse. I think we need to have supports for um, and to, to look at how we respond, but I think we have one third of the country at the moment that, uh, um, that will not have, even after the rollout, um, a, a 
a Caledonian perpetrator program. And what we're seeing and have been seeing for a long time um, is that criminal justice social work departments that don't have access to perpetrator programs, at, that to appropriately um, uh, accredited perpetrator programs like the Caledonian make it up as they go along. And because they are under such local pressure to provide some some um, intervention for courts. And, and I think it's really important that we take a look at the risk associated with all of the other different kinds of interventions by criminal justice social work with convicted offenders of domestic abuse that are supposed to um, uh, help them limit their reoffending because there's very little evidence base that says they do. And it provides, a, again, a sense of confidence about safety being provided to victims and their children, which is, which is not real. So I, I, I think that when we talk about the resources for criminal justice and for other parts of the system that might then come into play with the passage of this bill, we need to be, we need to be taking a look at perpetrator programs in the context of domestic abuse. And what are we going to do about the one third of Scotland that still won't have one? Sorry, that was no, my that's fine. Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> I'll, I'll need to try and remember both, it first. Both, uh, um, no, I, I mean, it's really about yeah. whether this is an opportunity to get people sort of out of prison who, who otherwise might have been, or whether the, there's a risk that electronic monitoring gets used to simply sort of add on to people that, that might already have community-based orders or sentences. I think it adds a, a, an option, um, and I think that the... I, I come back to the government's understanding that short-term prison sentences do more damage and are less likely to help people reconsider their way forward than community-based sentences. And community-based sentences have got a far higher success rate of people completing them and not going back to offending. So if there's some way in which electronic monitoring can support that positive side of things, then I think that's something that has to be looked at. But I don't think it should be, there should be no automatic process in any of this. I think it has to be done on an individual basis, taking in, into account everything that Marsha has said and everything that's been said by Nicola about the, the needs of the families affected by domestic abuse or the victims. I think it has to be worked out very, very carefully and not taken as a simple answer. Can I just jump in there and say that I think that there are, uh, the, the bill does introduce the scope for um, electronic or, or um, technological options to support a community or alcohol bracelets, for example, where they're used in the right context to support people who is already getting support in recovery from addiction, can be used on a, on a voluntary basis very effectively. Um, what you don't want is to um, add so many conditions that you're setting people up to fail, because that's not helpful. Um, on that very point, Professor, actually, I'm, I'm going to ask questions with reference to the electronic monitoring of alcohol <coughs> or, drug, or drug use, and, and what do you see as the opportunities and risks of that scheme being implemented? So maybe, Professor, you can start on that one as you just... We had addressed that in our, in our written evidence, yeah. saying that if, if you use it purely as a punitive measure, um, then that goes completely against recovery. Um, focused approaches. You, what you do, you can use it, however, as a supportive measure, um, ideally on a voluntary basis, which to, will support people who are trying to um, work towards their towards their recovery. Um, you know, you can use it as um, similar to what the young man was saying about tagging. You can actually use it as an excuse to avoid going out with your mates, going out to the pub, and so on. Um, but it does need to be used in that context rather than as as punishing people for um, for an addiction. Yeah, Pina. I agree. Right. I, 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 agree, I agree with Nancy that it, sh it should be a support, support process, right, not okay. a punitive thing. And it has to be voluntary as well. Yeah. Dr. Scott? Yeah. No. I agree. Yes. Okay, thank you. Jenny's. <laughs> into the panel. Uh, as a supplementary to Maurice Corey's question then, um, Nicola Fraser, in your submission you say with regard to GPS technology that this has the potential to give the victim a sense of security by limiting the movement of the offender and creating safe spaces for victims. But um, Marsha Scott, I was quite taken with some of the evidence that you had um, submitted and you point to the limitations of GPS um, in terms of it not being able to detect certain types of behaviour. So, for example, text, contact, chance encounters, as you describe it, social media contact as well. Um, and I note from your submission you're calling for further exploration with the Scottish Government and criminal justice partners in terms of the use of GPS uh, with bail conditions. 
Would the rest of the panel be supportive of doing that? And do you also acknowledge the limitations that perhaps GPS technology might provide with regard to certain uh, crimes in terms of domestic abuse? I think that uh, we have to be very careful that we don't have a sort of one-stop shop solution here. And I think that the use of GPS um, has got a great potential, but I think that we need to make sure that it is properly supported and carried out in a way which means that the victims, um, particularly, are protected in a, in a way that is, uh, gives them sufficient confidence that they can go on with things. As for controlling access to social media or the telephone, I don't know how we can do that. And I, I, I understand the reason for that being raised as an issue, but I think that that's where the support element of comes in uh, for somebody who's under monitoring, is that they have to be supported towards realising that making contact by the, by the means suggested is wholly inappropriate and harmful. And so I think the support element there is the important bit. Rather, I don't think we can stop people from accessing machines that will communicate with others. I think in that respect, you know, if you're dealing with different kinds of victims, um, and I certainly totally respect that it's different in a domestic abuse situation, we can also look at things like stalking or, or those kinds of cases where um, the perpetrator is often very manipulative, very clever, um, very underhand, and, and I agree, you know, that it's very difficult to stop access to internet, texting, whatever, unless my only feel, feeling would be is if that's part of the order, that they're not allowed to contact or they're not allowed to enter a zone, then the second they breach that, we're back to community having faith in that breach process. So is it a case of if there's an exclusion zone and a buffer zone and somebody goes in, that we deal with that immediately to give that victim confidence? And they need then to be able to report back and say, he keeps contacting me and therefore that's a breach. So there's a lot of different ways. I totally get it with domestic abuse. It's a totally different thing. And a lot of domestic abuse also is based around family members, children, you know, you tend to find that they're desperate to get access for children. So you've got lots and lots of different processes involved. But I think it has to come down as part of the order, part of the risk management, and also part of the breach process. Thank you. Can I just underlining that this all needs to be done in very close discussion and uh, communication with, with the victims. Um, because, I mean, I, we were working with a family not long ago where um, the, the ex-partner was sending a series of, of abusive and threatening texts, and so the police response was to remove his phone. But the problem was that the phone was the one way that they knew where he was. <laughs> so um, it made it actually more disconcerting for the victim for him not to have his phone than it was for them to be receiving the, the texts in the first place. So it's just making sure that that is, is, the, is the conversation and it's not taken out of the victim's hands. There's been some very encouraging research, it's a bit old now, but um, around use of GPS, active monitored, actively monitored GPS um, with an uh, exclusion zone that's sizable enough to give women confidence that they will, you know, that there's an, al there's an alarm set up so that um, uh, they know that there's not going to be any surprises in the middle of the night, um, uh, um, you know, without the alarm going off. And really important, and that they they trust that there'll be a response when when that alarm goes off that that is timely and and sufficiently robust. And those are really important conditions. But again, you know, this is a bit about let, let's make this work for us absolutely in communication with victims because you know this this. Everybody will say, oh, well, it might not work here or there. Um, we have the keys to use this, I think, but it, it'll be absolutely critical that we, that, that we explore the impact of it initially and test that before we roll it out, I think. And so GPS is quite exciting from our perspective, but um, it's not, it's not a, you know, magic. <laughs> Clear then, given it is a little bit vague in the bill about um, what would happen with breach, is that something that should be explored further as we're scrutinising this bill to, to ask for more information and detail going into 
to breach, um, to perhaps ask for pilots, to test the various scenarios that can map the mobile phone. Yeah, it's good to have it because at least you know where they are. But if they're then using it in a way that is calling a fear alarm or um, continuing the very behaviour that um, they've got the electronic monitoring for, then that needs to be dealt with. Do you think there's sufficient on in the bill at present or does more need to be added as we scrutinise this on the face of the bill? Because it seems to me this is the, the difference between this being a very effective and worthwhile tool and potentially going in the wrong direction. I think if you want to build community confidence in this, then it needs to be zero tolerance. I understand that zero tolerance is very difficult because you need a lot of your statutory bodies to buy in. So the police would need to react quickly. How the courts then react quickly, I don't know, because normally they'll get a breach report and then they'll assign a hearing within four weeks. Well, four weeks is no good to a victim. So I agree with you in some terms, we maybe need to look deeper into how the actual system will cope with increased breaches if we're taking zero tolerance in relation to these things. Okay, any other, Marsha? I, I think we definitely need more clarity about the status of a breach. Will it be a criminal offense? How, in, in what circumstances? What, you know, uh, it's already a real problem in terms of CPOs. Let's not replicate that problem. Let's, let's be clear from the beginning how we expect these to, to work, you know, how these orders to work in the context of, um, uh, offenders who are who are not necessarily um, going to ha have that good positive response to community disposals, um, which many will, but domestic abuse offenders, there's a big question mark about. Thank you. And Pete? I have nothing, nothing to add. I'm, I'm fully in support of what uh, Marcia and Nicola have said, and I think it's um, a way forward, but we have to be very, very careful um, that we do it properly, so a little bit more direction in the bill would be helpful. Okay. Uh, anything to add to it? No, nothing to add. That's good. Uh, John, you're just supplementary before I Thank you very on. much, Convener. I, I wonder, panel, um, we have a submission from uh, Social Work Scotland, which I have to say I entirely agree with, and that is regarding one aspect, the remote alcohol monitoring, where they say, they say it's important to acknowledge that the typical journey towards change may involve several lapses or relapses, for example. So in relation to uh, the issue of someone with a, an alcohol addiction problem, um, and, and I'm simply talking about the consumption of alcohol rather than any other issues, would you understand that there must be a level of discretion around how that breach is responded to, please? It's not something that we commented on, but um, going from experience with things like drug testing and treatment orders, there are a lot of times that somebody could relapse. Is it not that it would be beneficial to be in that sort of style where it monitors somebody's alcohol level as a part of the support? But I think it would be somewhere they'd have to have started that pathway and you would need the kinds of support um, with alcohol counselling, etc. Are you talking, John, about um, the use of alcohol bracelets? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I mean, I think... out. If there's, you know, if there's no involvement of domestic abuse, then I think what we have to look is what does the literature tell us about recovery, um, and you know, it tells us that you know, recovery from addiction involves lapses. So I, I think that the 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 construction of a response around that needs to reflect what we know about it's most likely to helpful to be helpful in recovery. Um, I, I, I think like with the other elements of the bill, that it, we would benefit enormously from, and I know that there's a plan to do some pilots about including alcohol bracelets in the pilots, to find out just how it works, because I'm quite concerned about a, a punitive response to them, but I'm also concerned that because people misunderstand the relationship between domestic abuse and alcohol, they think that if they keep an offender from drinking, that that will keep them from offending, and that's a really dangerous assumption. I think that the um, concept of people wearing those bracelets is a good one, but I think it has to be a voluntary decision. And the person has to put themselves up for that, and I think that's part of the recovery process. So there will be lapse and, there, and relapse in all of this, but the direction of travel, I think, is one that can be supported uh, in the right circumstances um, to help people move away from their use of alcohol and, uh, like, and 
their likelihood to reoffend. The term zero tolerance earlier, Mr. White. I mean, people might understand that with going somewhere where you shouldn't go, but sitting in your house and breaching that, you would hope for a measure of discretion to be afforded the authorities with that, I presume. What a wonderful question, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think that the... You can work the, out the... I, 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 I think that a, a, lot, a lot depends on the, the way in which somebody conducts themselves prior to the breach in terms of alcohol. I think that's a different thing from somebody breaching an order um, which is to do with their behaviour in the wider community. I think just to, to add to that, that um, I think there are different types of technology that are uh, addressed in the bill, and therefore if the bill is to um, improve the response or have a clear, clearer section regarding breach, I think there are then different responses to breach based on the different types of technology that we're talking about. So I think there is a, a probably a different type of response to um, you know, going outside uh, a curfew or outside a boundary compared to um, use of an alcohol bracelet. So it's just trying to make sure that the, uh, whether it's the guidance documents or whether it's the, the kind of nuances within the bill itself can actually uh, address that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I just wondered if you would agree that um, before this bill comes to fruition, um, it's absolutely vital that it's communicated to the public in the correct way. And I'm thinking in relation to families and children and to remove the stigma, you know, that you, you were talking about. And also, you know, I, I, I can imagine that children will need some form of counselling, you know, to mm -hmm. younger children particularly, um, you know, to, to, to answer their questions about why mum or dad can't leave the house between certain hours or big brother or big sister. And, and that's going to require a lot of work. Would you agree with me? That's what we do <laughs> as yeah. an organisation. So yes, I do agree that it does require a, a great deal of work and a, and a willingness to talk about it because the tendency is to try to um, pretend that something else is happening, whether it's uh, daddy's working away, your brother's gone into the military, mummy's in hospital. You could see similar types of excuses being used for tagging as well. And in order for um, children and young people to be able to deal with these sorts of issues, they do need to be able to mm -hmm. have open, honest conversation where they can ask questions. Yeah. And just on a wider level for communicating with the public and, you know, I can see some hysterical headlines already, you know, um, when this comes out. So we, we need to be very careful about how, um, how it's put over to the public and, and just how we communicate it um, so that it doesn't have a, a detrimental effect. A bit tied by the press who always go for the negative aspects. Yeah. We get that all the time. Somebody commits an offence while tagged or does this or while on bail. But they never report on the positivities. And let's face it, there has been a lot of positive mm -hmm. stuff has come out of community-based. It's supporting victims. It's yeah. supporting people to get back into the community. Mm -hmm. So it's how we get it out there on a positive note. Yeah. That's, that's the major issue. Mm -hmm. But without getting buy-in from the community, that's a difficult one to sell. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I... I think this is about what kind of a country we want to be and what kind of communities we want to be. And, and I think that we can equally say that this is not, this is about, um, this is about having second chances for everybody, but it's also about making some people safer. You know, I mean, I, the, and I think it can be the message is about how to, that this is a, 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 a balanced approach given the changes that we all hope you'll make. Um, this is a balanced approach to making sh sure that people who are very vulnerable get both the supports they need, but also the, the technological protections that we might be able to provide. I think that there are a number of other um, initiatives underway which will support this um, bill being uh, publicized mm -hmm. along the lines of the Employers Support Network as an example. Um, where people are going to talk about people with convictions and talk about the benefits of them uh, finding work. Uh, Disclosure Scotland's Scotland Works For You uh, programme is another one which is doing a very good job at saying that, OK, if somebody's committed an offence and been punished for it, it's time they can move on and do so in a structured way. Yeah. And so I think this, is, is, this is not standing alone, mm. uh, and I think we can do something very positive with it. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, just a, a brief question with regard to resourcing. Um, Dr. Marshall Scott, you mentioned previously that only a third of the country uh, have access to the Caledonian Perpetrator Programme. 
And we heard in the previous evidence session from Social Work Scotland, um, and they also highlighted in their written submission that um, the use of uh, electronic monitoring in Scottish prisons as a condition of temporary release from prison may further increase the number of assessments completed jointly by community-based and prison-based social work, and this may also impact on staffing levels and resources. Um, do you foresee that the legislation in its current form um, impact, will impact upon your organisation in terms of resources? I think, as I said, for, first of all, I just need to make sure that I wasn't given the wrong idea. We don't actually have Caledonian in, in two-thirds of, of communities at the moment, but it right. is getting rolled out to yeah. an additional one-third. Yeah. But we will still then have a, a gap of yeah. a third once that happens. And I, I think it ha I do foresee some questions, um, some concerns, uh, in part because if this is done correctly, it means more information flow. It needs to be more information flow with prison officials, with um, victims and children, um, uh, with criminal justice social work, and um, sharing information in our GDPR world at the moment is quite complicated and difficult. Um, and uh, the, the other additional thing is if we have fewer people in custody, which is a bit of a nightmare from our perspective in some ways, then that means more burdens on our women's workers and children's workers in terms of providing advocacy in the legal system. So um, this is not a plea for more money. This is a, an, a please, we need an, an impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Although, if there's more money around, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mary. I'd really just like to ask a question on uh, an area that we haven't really touched on in the evidence that we've heard so far, and it's around uh, part three of the bill and the, parole, the changes to the parole board for Scotland. And I know that in a couple of the submissions that we've had, um, I think particularly from um, yourself, Pete, it was about, well, you say that there's a lack of understanding amongst the prison population and the wider public of the detailed workings and procedures of the, of the parole board. Um, so it was really just to try to tease that out a bit more, and because uh, I think it, from sitting on the Justice Committee is certainly an area that we haven't heard too much about and we're not too familiar with. And really also the evidence from families outside about the uh, engagement with families through the parole process and to hear a bit more about that. I think that the difficulty um, that I've highlighted in my uh, response is that there's a great many myths uh, go around prison halls and the people who have successfully negotiated the parole process are not still in the prison to tell people how it works because, because they've gone. Yeah. And I think that the, um, the rumours and the misunderstandings are something that lead to a lot of people um, failing to manage their expectations with any kind of factual basis to them. And I think that the, uh, that leads to a lot of upset and um, anxiety, which reflects its, uh, appears as um, anti, uh, anti-social behaviour in the prison itself because people are frustrated when, if they understood how the process worked, they'd realise that perhaps their opportunities for parole were further away than they imagined. Um, I would underline that our organisation, we're not particular experts on the, the operation of the, of the parole board um, by any means, and, and I think our written response uh, said that quite clearly, but we do feel that there is a, an opportunity, I think, to engage families in the conversation about um, uh, release and prepara preparation for release um, much more effectively than happens at the moment. Um, another example is um, the fact that in, in preparing someone for release, they might not discuss um, conditions of parole or conditions of release and, and um, uh, housing, for example, where they're allowed to live depending on the nature of the offence. Um, until six weeks prior to release. Um, and if you're a, a family that is willing to support the person in, 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 in their release, and um, we were working with a family that were willing to, willing to sell the house, uh, move somewhere else, relocate the kids in different schools and, and so on, but they weren't actually involved in that conversation at all until six weeks prior to release, which is not really enough time to make quite major life-changing decisions for the entire family. It's also recognizing that families um, why they, while they might be supportive, they're not just a tool in the, the resettlement of, of the person coming out of prison. Um, and it's recognizing the impact on them in their own right, um, as well as um, their ability to support someone on, on their release, because there will be um, 
complexities in relationships and families and um, just making sure they're recognized as um, people who are impacted separately from what's happening to the, mm -hmm. the person coming out of prison. So really there needs to be more more information and I suppose better general awareness of how the whole process works and really involving people in that at an earlier stage. And making sure that they are, they are involved in that in that discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Often there is a perception from the family's perspective that um, social work assessments, because social workers are required to visit the home um, for people who are coming out of prison after a long-term sentence, um, that that visit is specifically in relation to the prisoner and not in relation to what the families themselves may need. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask again about the parole board? Um, at present, there must be a High Court judge and there must be a psychiatrist. Now, they're saying um, in the bill that that maybe isn't ne that isn't necessary. The judicial member really sits, and the role can be fulfilled by legal members of the board. And there are also sufficient members with experience of forensic psychiatry. Um, would you have a concern about um, these two elements being removed? from a must-have in the parole board? I think, I think one of the issues there is sometimes the parole hearings can't go ahead when one of those people is missing. Right. And I think that, that is my understanding of the reason for the, the, the changes being proposed. I wonder if that's a good reason. I mean, they should be there, I would have thought, to, to assess. But. Uh -huh. I, I guess I just have to chime in and my expertise on parole boards is pretty thin too, I have to confess. But I, I would say, and it's been an hour and I haven't talked about the importance of, tr of training for sheriffs who hear domestic <laughs> abuse cases. I can't believe it. Um, so I will just say that, that um, I think we, ne we need more evidence um, in the whole system from victims and um, their advocates around the impact of release, the likely impact of release on them and their children. And um, while I, I um, absolutely think that the judiciary and the psychiatrists are, are um, uh, welcome to add their expertise. I'm not convinced that they always understand the dynamics of domestic abuse. Right. And can I just ask the panel finally that um, the Scottish male ministers have the ability to add to the list and the regulations. Would that be a, a concern that it was done that way? Is this in terms of? Oh, yeah, electronic monitoring, yeah. I think it's um, fair that we allow for the fact that technology will move faster than government. And I think that the possibility of new developments coming along uh, being uh, identified as uh, useful and appropriate in terms of monitoring, I think if it was held back by a parliamentary process, I think it might be, um, that wouldn't be good. Okay. okay, that's helpful. One last question. Um, Community Justice Scotland uh, were very, very, uh, I think, strident on, on the terminology, the use of offender and um, ex-offender. Could I have the, the, the panel's views on, on that? On the 1st of May 2015, the Scottish Government agreed to never use ex-offender and ex-prisoner again in terms of uh, Cabinet Secretary, Ministerial and other speeches and uh, publications. So that was a decision made and has been honoured by cabinet secretaries, ministers and other politicians and civil servants. I think when somebody has been found guilty of an offence, they, no, they no longer are an offender. They are either a prisoner or they're someone serving a community-based sentence. And I think the, the term offender is one that holds people back when they're already in the justice system. People in prison were surveyed some years ago to find out what name they would, what term they would find comfortable. And they said, if, if I'm not going to be a person, then I'm going to be a prisoner, because they realise they are somebody being held inside a prison. But I think that the way forward is one that was very well put by Community Justice Scotland, that the, the labelling of somebody as an ex-prisoner or an offender, when they're already being processed away from that offence back to the situation where they might join, rejoin society, is not helpful. And is there a balance to be struck? Do other, um, do other panelists have another view, maybe looking from the victim's perspective? I'm, I am slightly uncomfortable with the, that statement. And again, I guess I would say in certain contexts I would be totally supportive, but I also think that we, um, that in the context of domestic abuse, where we know re-victimization, re-offending is so much more likely than many crimes, that I think, um, uh, 
we, the, at the moment, we suffer from a failure to share the information about the background of um, uh, uh, convicted abusers, which is a phrase we use. Uh, and I think uh, we need to be very careful that the balance manages, doesn't um, underplay the risk that they continue to, po many of them continue to pose to their families and to future partners. Okay. Nicola and, and Nancy? I think <clears throat> a lot of victims are actually in some ways tied by the criminal justice system in as much as <clears throat> this could be their first time to actually go through the system and it uses terminology all the time. Um, how it actually affects them, it's not something I've ever asked a victim what they want to call them. Most of the time it wouldn't be uh, repeatable anyway, <laughs> so um, whether it actually changes anything for them, but we don't work on sort of that side, so it, it's not something I would, you know, I, I don't feel it has a massive impact on victims. And then I, I, I do think that the terminology is, is unhelpful, to be honest, not only because of the, the labeling of, you know, labeling someone according to the, the worst thing they've ever done, um, but also in fact that it creates a dichotomy between those people over here and, and you know, the offenders and the victims when often both of them have had both experiences. Um, I think there's also um, a, re a lack of recognition in, the, in the, the bill that it's not just talking about people who have been convicted but talking about people on remand who may not be offenders and may not actually ever be convicted. So I think it's just the reality of, of trying to be clear about what we're actually talking about. Thank you all very much. That concludes our questions and we'll now suspend briefly just to allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you very much.